Muy buenos días para los que participan en esta reunión. A very good morning uh, to those participating in this meeting in the Americas. Good afternoon and good evening for those participating in Europe and Asia. I would like to give all of you a warm welcome to this second seminar of legislators and former legislators of the world to pick up the urgent and perilous uh, uh, subject. Mi nombre es Denis Small, soy el director. Well, please let's stop the danger of nuclear war. My name is Dennis Small. I am the Ibero-American director for the Institu Schiller Institute. Three weeks ago, we carried out a first uh, workshop uh, convened by the Schiller Institute. And at this uh, second seminar meeting, we would like to thank particularly the uh, Chamber of Deputies of Mexico and uh, Congressman Benjamin Robles Montoya, who has uh, provided for us an excellent conference room uh, for for the uh, Workers' Party in the Mexican Congress. Thank you very much for your support. We are also connected by Zoom to panelists from eight countries and an international audience that is following this broadcast with simultaneous interpretation into English, French, and German. For those of you who haven't done so yet, please click on the interpreting icon in your screen and there uh, in select your language. If it's English, English, and so forth, the other languages. On December 21st, 2021, two months before the special military operation of Russia and Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin addressed an extraordinary meeting of the Defense Ministerial Council in his country and sounded the alarm two months before the Ukrainian operation. He said, among other things, the following. What they are doing on the territory of Ukraine now, or trying to do and going to do, this is not thousands of kilometers away from our national border. This is at the doorstep of our home. They must understand that we simply have nowhere to retreat further. Do they think we don't see these threats? Or do they think we are so weak-willed to simply look blankly at the threats posed against Russia? Russia had insisted once and again that NATO, the United Kingdom, and the United States needed to keep in mind not only their own security interests, but also those of Russia and all other nations of the planet. They insisted that international security is indivisible, that is, there must be security for everyone, or there will be no security for anyone. This is not a new idea. Friedrich uh, Schiller, uh, whose uh, name we've taken in the Schiller Institute, the great uh, historian, uh, playwright, and poet of the 19th century in Germany, had already said that it was possible and necessary that we should be, at the same time, patriots of our own nations, as well as citizens of the world. We might also point out what the uh, great Mexican president Benito Juarez said on June, uh, July 15, 1867, in his famous proclamation, after having defeated the invaders and uh, the emperor, the Habsburg emperor Maximilian to establish the Republic and famously said, among individuals, as among nations, the respect for the rights of others is peace. Today, in the 21st century, with the world at the edge of a possible thermonuclear war, and with a economic and financial crisis that is already sinking parts of the planet into a new medieval dark ages, a systemic disintegration crisis that impels us towards this final war. I would dare add two simple words to Benito Juarez's famous immortal 
uh, stranger, uh, statement. Among individuals as among nations, the respect for the rights of others to develop is peace. We've come together on this occasion to discuss these difficult and profound topics to evaluate, uh, propose solutions, and mobilize others in each of our countries and around the world. It is uh, quite uh, notable, for instance, that uh, two days ago, the first Congress person in the United States who has raised her voice against the uh, against nuclear war, Congressman Paul Gosar, a Republican from Arizona, wrote an open letter to Presidents Putin and Zelensky telling them how urgent it is to begin conversations to halt the escalation of nuclear tensions. Today we have a distinguished panel of some 15 presenters, twice as many as participated in our first meeting three weeks ago. I will be introducing them when they come up for their presentations, and then we will go to a roundtable discussion among all of us. We will also uh, entertain written uh, questions sent for those of you either in English or in Spanish to preguntas uh, at schillerinstitute.org. Hopefully, you will be able to see this address on your screen. We will begin with the words of the founder of the Schiller Institute, Helga zeppler -Rich. She is an expert on uh, Schiller's work, as well as Nicholas of Cusa, the great European Renaissance philosopher. She founded the Schiller Institute and the committee on the coincidence of opposite. She is the widow and closest uh, political collaborator of uh, Lyndon LaRouche, with whom they visited over 40 year, uh, countries to develop a policy solution to the current disintegration policy. Welcome, Helga LaRouche. Hello. Well, I greet you wherever you may be. Um, what brings this meeting together, which is actually a, con a sequent meeting to one we had on October uh, 7th, where with the distinguished uh, congressmen and women from Latin America, um, it was clear to us that you know we had to do an extra effort to mobilize the world population uh, to the danger in which we are. And I think that one of the most disturbing facts about the present situation is that for those who have looked at the danger of nuclear war and the escalation, uh, who are realizing that the vast majority of human beings on this planet have no inkling on what kind of a powder keg we are sitting. And if you think back to the early 80s, when we had the medium range missile crisis in Europe between the SS-20 and the Pershing II being uh, directed against each other with only a few minutes warning time, you had hundreds of thousands of people in the street warning of World War III. And today where the situation is so much more dangerous, there is very little, uh, there are some demonstrations, but not in any you know, correspondence to the possibility of the extinction of civilization, which is what we are talking about, if only one nuclear weapon would be used. Just to give you a, a sense, we have today the 27th of October. Until October 30th, that's another three days, you have simultaneously the entire NATO and the entire Russian armed forces being involved in their annual nuclear exercise. You know, that means the arsenals of the two largest nuclear powers are right now rehearsing a nuclear war because that is the basis of the steadfast uh, uh, noon maneuver. That's the NATO maneuver, uh, which is exercising 
the you know readiness of their nuclear arsenal and given the fact that you know this is the main target is Russia they are rehearsing a tactic a, a nuclear war against Russia uh, Un segundo, that, means, ya that means that uh, the entire arsenal of B52 bombers have been brought from the United States to the European theater and at the same time Uh, the Russians have their maneuver, also their regular annual maneuver called Grom, which is the Russian word for thunder. And um, they are also involved in a large maneuver, including the live missile launches. Now, given the tension, you know, this is not just a routine uh, maneuver, even so it has been declared by both sides to be that. But, you know, this is in the middle of uh, a situation in the Ukraine war, which is getting more dangerous uh, by the day. This is in the context of all kinds of maneuvers. For example, remember that the Russian defense uh, minister, Shoigu, just a few days ago had called all his uh, colleagues, uh, the defense ministers of the US, UK, France and Turkey, Uh, warning them that you know that they had intelligence about uh, the Ukraine preparing a, a dirty bomb, a dirty nuclear bomb, which they then in a fake operation uh, would claim Russia for. Naturally, this was denied by the Ukrainian side. But just yesterday, Shoigu continued this series of phone calls by calling the Indian and the Chinese uh, defense ministers also discussing uh, this situation. Now, only a very short time ago, uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine in a meeting in your, with your Australians had basically called for a preemptive use of, tech, of nuclear weapons against Russia, which then was pulled back. And his aide said he didn't mean it that way. Stoltenberg, the NATO general secretary, said that a victory of Russia in Ukraine would be a defeat of NATO and therefore could not be tolerated. Um, and President Biden, only on October 6, in a more or less private meeting, had warned about the use of uh, tactical nuclear weapons from the side of Russia, which could lead to an Armageddon, which then also was uh, corrected. Uh, Defense Secretary uh, Minister Shoigu said that the use of uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine is absolutely not on the table and, and not even in on the horizon. And naturally, all of this takes place in the context of uh, which side has what nuclear doctrine. I mean, it is uh, an absolute fact that the Russian Uh, nuclear doctrine or military doctrine provides for the use of nuclear weapons only in the case that the territorial existence of Russia is at stake. And, you know, that obviously uh, is not uh, the case under normal circumstances. While on the other side, since the Bush administration, uh, the United States has a first strike doctrine. And that is something which is absolutely not discussed. And I think we have to discuss it because uh, ever since the U.S. has the prompt global strike doctrine, uh, it does have the element of a first strike use. Now, when President Biden came into office in uh, February or January 2021, uh, he promised that he would uh, basically clarify that and um, uh, basically uh, you know, correct the, the uh, U.S. doctrine by for a sole purpose uh, only, that only in order to deter, uh, uh, you know, a nuclear attack, or if necessary, retaliate a nuclear attack, would the United States themselves use nuclear weapons? So I think we need to have a, a very uh, broad discussion among experts, among military experts, Is it acceptable to be part of NATO when the policy of that NATO is a first strike uh, policy? 
Now, the debt is not uh, some theoretical question very far away. We should note the fact that uh, in February 2021, it was the leader of the uh, strategic command, uh, Admiral uh, <clears throat> Richard, who had advised the Pentagon to change the likelihood of the use of nuclear weapons <clears throat> from not likely to likely. So that was uh, the response. And just <clears throat> last week, uh, the United States um, <clears throat> USS West Virginia uh, ballistic missile submarine surfaced in the Arabian Sea and uh, now uh, an Russian expert Alexander Timokin wrote in the <coughs> magazine Yusukart, which is the Russian word for view, basically said that the very unlikely occurring of that Russian submarine surfacing, you know, normally these submarines don't like to be seen and their <coughs> location is supposed to be a secret, would have been a demonstration on the side of the United States that they are capable to deliver a first strike to disarm the Russian uh, uh, nuclear arsenals in a preemptive way and prevent uh, Russian retaliation by basically putting such missiles on a flat trajectory rather than a ballistic one, and therefore shortening the flight time Uh, 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 significantly, and therefore, you know, depriving the Russian side of, you know, basically going for a second strike, a counter strike. Now, I don't know. This all is very, uh, very some, and I think we do need a public debate about that, because if we are that close to the, you know, mistrust and the assumption that, you know, this could happen. You know, and the Russians uh, have this doomsday uh, strategy whereby if the Russian leadership would be eliminated in a first strike, uh, you know, then they have an automatism which would set into motion all the nuclear capability, even if the Russian leader leadership is already eliminated. Now, uh, I think that all of these uh, developments are really reason to have a, a total alarmist situation, I mean, what is at stake is the existence of the human species. And we have discussed at the previous meeting um, on October 6th, uh, 7th, that the fact that because if there would be a nuclear war, and it is the agreement of all competent military experts that there is no such thing as a tactical nuclear war, if one single nuclear weapon is used the entire arsenal will be used and that will be the end of civilization uh, because a nuclear winter would kill off in all likelihood those few billions who would su survive uh, the actual nuclear war and it would probably be the end of the human race or at least in the form as we know it now and if some miserable people would survive in the following years, one should remember the word of John F. Kennedy who said that those who die in the first hours will be lucky as compared to those who manage to live on for a couple of weeks or months or even years. So therefore, because it is the existence of all of civilization, which is at stake, we discussed that that by definition makes that every person on this planet is a world citizen and has to think like a world citizen because we have been catapulted to be representative of the one humanity whose existence is at stake right now. So this is why we want to escalate this mobilization. We want to bring it into all countries and we want to evoke from a group of nations, whatever it may be, that they must address this condition. We must have an emergency session of the UN General Assembly or another occasion would be at the upcoming G20 meeting in Indonesia, mid of uh, November. But a group of nations has to come forward and offer an alternative to this danger. The Schiller Institute has mobilized since the outbreak of this war to have an international conference, to have a 
new paradigm to have a new international security and development architecture, which takes into account the interest of every single country on the planet, which means a European security architecture clearly has failed. If we don't include countries which right now are supposed to be uh, completely excluded, and there is actually an effort going on to decouple the United States and Europe and some of their few allies uh, from Russia, China, the BRICS countries, the SCO, uh, and that will not work. You cannot split the world in two places and think that with all the problems we have, that there can be <clears throat> a solution. So we need a motion to put on the table a new international security and development architecture, a new world economic order, which addresses also the fact that the transatlantic financial system is in a hyperinflation or a blowout. Uh, we have seen in the case of Great Britain and the unfortunate uh, fate of uh, the short-term Prime Minister Liz Truss uh, that you know the effort by the central bank, so in that case by the Bank of England, to go for first quantitative easing, pumping money, then seeing that this leads to inflation, then going to quantitative tightening, then realizing that may lead to a collapse of the stock and bond market, then going back to quantitative easing. This is not going to be a viable solution. And if the European Central Bank is doing the same thing in the next several days, they will have the same experience like the Bank of England had. We are at the end of the system and we need a new monetary system, a new credit system, which allows to overcome poverty for every person on this planet. We need to have a, a new uh, conception of how to organize the affairs so that every country on this planet can develop its fullest potentials. So this is what we want to instigate a broad discussion about. And, uh, you know, as uh, Dennis was saying, you know, it was Schiller's conviction that you can be a patriot of your country and act as a world citizen at the same time, acting in the interest of all of humanity. And we have reached in the history of mankind that point where either you, the human species makes that sort of evolutionary jump to think in terms of the one humanity first and then puts the national interest second. It's okay to have a national interest, but it should never be contrary to the interest of humanity as a whole. So we are calling to organize a movement of world citizens of all countries to unite because that may be the last resort to stop something which, you know, not even a historian would be left over to comment on. So we want to invite all of you to participate and help to spread that effort. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, eh, Helga. Well, thank you very much, Helga, Mrs. Zeplerus. You have stated the issue in all its gravity, addressing it with solutions on the table. I know that many such solutions will be offered during our discussion today. We will follow up with the presentation by Mexican Congresswoman Maria de Los Angeles Huerta. She is a professor, has been a professor, a social uh, campaigner, uh, Congresswoman, and she is uh, uh, forwarding a uh, policy of the fourth transformation as defined by Mexican President Lopez Obrador. Uh, please go ahead, Congresswoman Huerta. If you will unmute your microphone, please. Uh, will you please turn on your microphone? Thank you. Thank you very much for your important attendance in this forum and also I would like to thank Helga Zeplerus for the opportunity to participate again in this 
realm and we greet you from Mexico. I think that after this diagnosis, we are aware that we want to transform the world that is threatened today with the imminent danger of war. And we have to stop terrible disaster that can and is uh, occurring today as a consequence of many unresolved problems. If we wish, wish to create a truly different world in which it is not just a handful of people who own practically all material and natural resources and which belong to all of us. If we want to see a truly profound transformation that really shows us that we as humanity learned the lessons by left by the two world wars in the 20th century, the global COVID-19 pandemic, and of course, the current threat of nuclear war described by Helga due to the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine, uh, leading to this final uh, opportunity to steer and change course in the world. We need to do something, something that will guarantee our right to life and happiness. We cannot continue to be mere uh, spectators of a possible planet-wide disaster. We must transform ourselves right now into active citizens of the world that we want, the world that we must change. I believe this is the most important thing right now, a collective awareness that being mere spectators, spectators is no longer viable, never was, but far less so at this time. So we believe that in order to achieve this radical transformation away from devastation and inequality, moments in which our peace, integrity, and world security are threatened, all of us as human beings, as Helga has emphasized, need to, uh, to act, to get moving. My specific proposal at this time is that we build an organization for global collective action, as has been previously mentioned, because we need to be already a force with a determining influence in the international dialogue, and we must also establish a presence that will help to define peaceful solutions and uh, re reorient the architecture, the economic and uh, security architecture, as has always already uh, been mentioned. Our initiative uh, presented here, and which was discussed in the previous seminary, and which at this time I am simply summarizing for you, is first, we need to convene a world day of uh, debate and reflection, not merely national citizen mobilizations that we can organize and put forward, but we need to think globally as citizens of the world of a single initiative to address this danger. And we also need to define specific policies to help us define the um, policy alternatives and amongst us all to design some kind of global agenda that can be the basis for this global action plan. So if uh, these points that have been discussed in our agenda were to be included in this planetary agenda for discussion and debate, we would then aim for uh, the next uh, workshop, which our, uh, our friend Helba would also uh, bring together social and political analysts and uh, students of all the world to, to propose the following, to convene a World Day of Debate and Reflection to consolidate citizen actions uh, necessary to stop this uh, potential danger of nuclear war. We need to motivate the parties involved in this 
great conflict between Russia and Ukraine by uh, declaring a truce as the pres Mexican president had already um, proposed, a truce during which the necessary dialogue can be carried out to establish the conditions of collaboration and transformation that will set in motion a new world order. The second point of this agenda would be to define a new system for world economic development, a new way ahead, a moral and humanist economic model based on an economic framework defi as defined by our, our president here in Mexico, a moral humanist model, which increases equality among world uh, nations and population. Thirdly, as part of our agenda to design a new international security architecture, as was uh, very well uh, stated by uh, Helga, that will truly guarantee world peace and stop any uh, kind of nuclear or chemical bacteriological warfare that endangers the human species. The fourth point would be to propose a new world energy model to guarantee our successful survival based on concepts expressed in the manifesto for life and for a ethic for sustainability which will guarantee that all countries including the poor ones will be able to develop adequately and finally the consolidation of a project for a uh, communications uh, work plan as a strategy to reach out to media that will uh, aid us in countering hegemonic narratives that spread internationally today, which attempt to legitimize uh, uh, the uh, global powers that presently exert their hegemony over the world, which is a narrative that uh, proposes its own uh, narrative of events and does not allow us as citizens of the world to uh, advance in our agenda. So we need to engage in a great communications agenda that with a specific um, work plan, which will lead to a global mobilization and uh, allow us to link up with different uh, leaders and uh, populations and which will bring about a global possibility of collaborating on the agenda that we propose. I will conclude here with this uh, proposal. I hope I have been able to encapsulate what has already been said in previous seminars and may this seminar bring about not only a more generalized awareness of this global problem we are addressing, but also establish our active presence and eagerness to participate and uh, help stop this urgent danger we may face. That's what I would like to tell you here from Mexico and as well as greet all of you in the various continents. And thank you very much, Helga. Well, thank you very much, Congresswoman Huerta. Something very radical must be done. You said it. And uh, you also proposed uh, five very specific points that we will no doubt be delving into during our discussion today. And the proposal of profound changes in the uh, international security and development architecture. I am most pleased at this time to introduce the our next uh, panelist. Uh, and I would like to remind you that this presentation is being heard in four languages, English, Spanish, French, and German. Uh, we are being uh, heard in at least four continents. We are um, we have confirmed for now, we've gotten possibly further uh, participants to participate in this movement, which is the, a movement to uh, stop the danger of nuclear war. 
and your participation is certainly welcome. Congressman Benjamin Robles Montoya is a uh, teacher. He has been a federal uh, representative of the state of Oaxaca since uh, 2018 for the Workers' Party. He was a senator from 2012 through 2016, and he has a master's in economics, public administration, government. Recently, the Lopez Obrador uh, government adopted seven of the anti-inflation measures that he presented as uh, president of the National College of um, Economists. We would like to hear his uh, proposals on how to promote the physical and spiritual well-being of peoples. And I would like to tell you from the beginning that Congressman uh, Robles has is uh, reaching out to others to sign the declaration coming out of this conference, which he will also add his signature to. Without further ado, Congressman Robles, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dennis. I respectfully greet Madam Helga Zeplerush, the president of the Schiller Institute. I also greet most respectfully the distinguished personalities from various countries uh, joining with us today, all of you friends of the world, we come to your side in this fight that must be given in terms that will bring us peace and avoid the danger of nuclear war. I also wish to thank Dr. Maria de los Angeles Huerta, and again, I repeat, to the uh, president of the Schiller Institute for inviting me to this seminar for global peace and to stop the danger of world war, nuclear war, because it is clear that uh, events that are recent to some, but for others have been going on for eight uh, years, uh, are not merely a war issue between Russia and Ukraine. They also have to do with a number of causes and consequences that threaten humanity. For this reason, I wish to uh, express to all of you present either physically, remotely, re virtually, the uh, warmest greetings from the Mexican uh, Chamber of Deputies, the lower house of Congress. Friends, uh, the issue of Ukraine, if you will allow me, to uh, give my opinion is an uh, inevitable uh, corollary of a crisis throughout the world economic crisis provoked by an imperial party that uh, controls all monetary movements, uh, transfers of real or fictitious uh, money to preserve its uh, uh, wealth and power. But this is at the expense of poverty, misery, the destruction of uh, the na many nations. And of course, through un un interminable uh, means of acquisition through debt. This is a problem that requires an immediate solution because these monetarist mechanisms, which you know so well, cannot be allowed to continue. This power is embedded in local uh, institutions throughout the planet where we see how private national armies are deployed under the protection uh, and uh, the two of the corporations or ne banking networks to um, to accumulate uh, uh, natural resources. These corporations and institutions who uh, manipulate interest rates also come out ahead. So even illegitimately, they still come ahead. I make this comment because a recession and inflation, in my view, are induced to increase the rate of liquidity required for their survival and to continue exerting tyrannical power and imposing uh, misery and austerity on millions 
upon millions of human beings. For, therefore, it is the time to raise our voices efficiently uh, in a way to bring about great transformations in the world. Here in Mexico, as many of you most likely know, the president of the Republic, Andres Manuel López Obrador, has, has identified this problem with absolute clarity. This is why he recently proposed an immediate halt to the war between Russia and Ukraine and proposed an urgent reorganization of the United Nations organization to place it at the service of humanity. I also believe that governments of all nations must join this initiative, not looking at how to sanction those involved, but how do we join together in stopping this stopping this immediate immense problem. For this reason, I would like to present to your consideration the formation of a group of legislators representing uh, all of the contents and nationalities to enter into a direct dialogue with the rulers of every nation interested in world peace and uh, the implementation of a new UN as President Mexico and Mexican President Lopez Obrador suggests, as well as a new world order uh, following uh, new uh, principles for humanity and fighting corruption against uh, development. So friends, we've uh, had occasion to live a moment of huge challenges as well as opportunities. We must not waste this opportunity. We cannot say farewell to the opportunity for peace and to bring development to the 7.5 billion human beings uh, living in 206 uh, nations and geographical regions. Therefore, I suggest that all the work that can be accomplished this morning is uh, completed for the benefit of all nations. I am very proud to participate with you in this seminar and all of you are embraced from the Mexico City and from the halls of Congress uh, for participating in this great uh, journey for towards peace. Thank you very much. Long live peace. Yes, long live peace, long live humanity. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman uh, Robles, uh, for your very um, uh, powerful ideas. I think we already have on the table many very interesting suggestions. And your idea, of course, the banks never lose, but the population, the world population does uh, continue to lose. So the idea of a group of legislators established to dialogue directly and personally with uh, rulers of many nations, I believe is a very uh, productive, interesting proposal, which we will take up during our discussions. We have a slight change of order in the uh, today's program in order to accommodate the participation of uh, Mexican Dr. Rodolfo Undarza, but he is presently in Colombia at a medical conference, so he only has a few minutes to participate in this meeting. He was a participating a participant in the previous seminar. He is a, a neurosurgeon and he has won uh, international awards on human rights and he is a former uh, representative to the uh, Mexican Congress for the city of Congress. Good morning, Congressman Ondarza. Thank you very much, Dennis. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to participate in this exciting project of the Schiller Institute, hosted as well by the Honorable Congress of the uh, Republic of Mexico. I greet all of the panelists and participants brought here by the cons by their concern for a uh, weapons uh, escalation that leads to a heightened danger against the uh, human uh, race. There is not only a danger of conventional uh, nuclear 
weapons uh, that were used, for instance, in 19, at the end of 1945 against a quarter million Japanese. But there, there, by 1990, there were already some uh, 70,000 nuclear warheads, which have been reduced to just a few thousand, but are more than enough to eliminate life on the planet. The United States and Russia, China, Great Britain, and France have uh, established a treaty uh, in 1968, together with 186 uh, states in which group uh, Pakistan, India, Israel, North Korea were included. And in spite of all of this, nuclear weapons have increased it from uh, $72 uh, billion dedicated to nuclear weapons to uh, another 1.4 billion in 2020. This is promoted by corporations which received a contract in 2020 to produce 1,000 units at a cost of $10 million each. The military uh, industry also uh, was behind the growth of the nuclear arsenal in the 50s and also created tactical warheads, which are small uh, nuclear weapons destined for the battlefield designed to spread radiation, which would have uh, the same uh, type of damages, lymphatic uh, disease and so forth. Moscow uh, apparently has uh, 2,000 tactical nuclear weapons from the Soviet era. And the United States has also a tactical nuclear arsenal. And nuclear war is unpredictable because its results will uh, lead to an initial 4 million dead and uh, hundreds of millions dead in the first four hours. This is, uh, this is uh, complemented by bioweapons, uh, which are devastating on a world uh, scale, and they have been prohibited by many treaties. There, there are numerous laboratories and uh, uh, test facilities in all continents of the world. Uh, they, they, have, they have taken up diseases such as anthrax and uh, many others. Remember the British plan to eliminate the Nazis in the 40s with the uh, uh, spread of anthrax. But this, the, 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 the total reach of the, such a disaster is still an unknown faster. As far as the plague, we also should remember that in, uh, in the province of uh, Xinjiang in, in China, they, there was a bombardment with the bubonic plague and China and Japan agreed 1946 to take steps towards banning these uh, bioweapons where there were uh, close to 700,000 weapons, mostly charged with uh, mustard gas. A report prepared in October uh, by Cambridge University states that weapons of genetic manipulation could potentially target uh, specific uh, DNA sequences, both China and Russia uh, denounced the biological and chemical laboratories that developed by the United States in Ukraine on uh, 28th of October, very recently, uh, in a, a meeting of uh, Belarusia, Zimbabwe, China, signed a declaration at the uh, General Assembly of the UN regarding military, biological, and chemical applications uh, by the United States in Ukraine in violation of uh, existing treaties. And uh, also 
the participation of the United States in a biological and chemical uh, weapons program in Ukraine, backed by the United States. In conclusion, I would say that it is necessary for this proposal that the societies of the Americas take a stand against uh, uh, this war danger and its consequences. And we in the uh, Pan American Organization for uh, Health, sa Safety, and Security to stop these threats on uh, life of human beings by joining together for freedom and peace. We need to join together to avoid a nuclear, chemical, and biological war that would end life in our planet. So I would also like to take this opportunity to invite you to create uh, the Organization for the Health and Development of World Society, an organization in which we could establish communication networks to benefit peace, human peace and development. This is of the utmost importance. And as our preceding speakers have said, this is the concern. This is the, the, the responsibility of those who have been uh, using military economic measures to control populations. So we need to assemble the political forces necessary to make progress in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ondarsa, for uh, taking some time away from your responsibilities in Bogota. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution. In fact, indeed, the chemical and biological uh, elements uh, of this threat need to be addressed. We have entered now the second part of this uh, session, having heard the presentation of our hosts. But, and we are now moving on to the perspective of various regions of the world, beginning with Latin America and the Caribbean. Then we will hear from Europe and after that, the United States. In the case of Latin America and um, the Caribbean, we have Mr. Donald Ramotar uh, from Guyana. He was the uh, parliamentary leader for the PVP in the Guyana uh, Congress, and he was also uh, president of Guyana from 2011 to 2015. He is the secretary general of the PPP, the uh, popular uh, party, and he's the director of the journal The Thinker, and he is a frequent contributor to international um, journals and publications. He is one of the previous participants in our previous conference. Mr. Ramatar, uh, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Mr. Moderator, uh, allow me first of all to thank the Shelley Institute for organizing this important conference at this particular time in the history of our world. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen all, we are meeting when the world is fe facing one of the most terrifying prospects of a nuclear war. This crisis has, can, can prove more dangerous than the October 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, and it must be stopped at all costs. The theory which the US and the United Kingdom in particular used to justify for having nuclear weapons um, when they were fighting against the peace movement in the latter part of the last century and their rejection for to, to the call for the abolition of nuclear weapons was that nuclear weapons were, was keeping the peace in our world. I think events today has shown that that, is a, that has been an excuse on their part, and it is, and it, it is a totally wrong conception. It is a holding the world at ransom in great terror. I ask what kind of peace can we have if it's going to be a balance of terror? Man mankind cannot continue 
in this type of atmosphere. Therefore, our first task is to put on the agenda the abolition of all nuclear weapons. That should be an immediate task of all of us individually and collectively at this point in time. We should start a campaign to outlaw these weapons of, of not necessarily mass destruction, but world destruction. Having said that, let me say it would not, it would not be an easy task. I say this because I believe that the problem lies in the imperialist system that is dominant in the world relations. By its nature, this system seeks total domination of the world so that conditions for massive enrichment and of the, of the, real, of the real powers, that is the big mega corporation, many of which profit heavily from war. Events occurring in Ukraine is bringing this out more clearly than ever before. In the first place, Russia was goaded into that, this war. We heard the NATO Secretary General saying that since 2014, NATO was preparing for a war against Russia. And in preparing that war, they were arming the Ukrainian army, training the Ukrainian army, which was the third largest army in Europe. Since then, they, armed, they, they, they have armed Ukrainian, and since then, they have continued to arm Ukraine with some very important modern weapons. And not only the army of Ukraine, but the fascist forces of Ukraine, the Azov forces. They have prevented Ukraine from speaking of peace. We heard, we know that in March of this year, um, there was good possibility for discussions to be started to bring peace about, but it was, it was deliberately scuttled by the United Kingdom and the United States because of the, of the fact that they wanted to have Russia in this war. They have stopped the, United, the European Union countries from promoting peace. I spoke about this the last time, the Minsk Accord, where France and Germany had specific responsibility and they allowed themselves to be browbeaten and to stop and to, to not allow the implementation of that accord that could have prevented what has taken place today. And moreover, since then, we have seen the destruction of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, and Europe, which is the ones that will suffer as much as Russia from this damage that has taken place on the pipelines, are either investigating in secret or they're not investigating at all or because I believe they know very well who did this and they don't want to have to come out against their allies. They have, unfortunately, they're behaving like colonies of the United States. They continue to pour modern weapons to Ukraine and financing mercenaries to fight against Russia. We see that long before the, the hostilities began, they had prepared the most widespread economic sanctions against Russia. President Biden called, it, called them the mother of all sanctions. They believe that those comprehensive sanctions coupled with the military hostilities would have destroyed Russia. Russia is fighting against all of Europe. And this time, similar to what happened when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, because when he invaded the Soviet Union, he had at his disposal all of Europe's industry behind him. And now, not only is all of Europe behind this war, but so too is Canada and the United States, and even Australia. Russia is fighting against all of Europe and North America. What, what is scaring the, 
NATO forces, the imperialist forces, the most now is the countermeasures that Russia has put in place. The economic blockade has not brought them the results that they hoped for because Russia has not been completely isolated as they had expected. <clears throat> Moreover, Russia has the strategic commodity in energy, energy supplies, which they are finding impossible to isolate. Moreover, Russia is providing um, alternatives to the US dollar for its international trade. Many countries are fighting, are, are finding this very attractive, attractive, and more and more are getting involved in, the, in trading in their own currencies. And this is causing a lot of nightmares in Washington. Russia has also created an alternative to the SWIFT banking system that is also very important in breaking the monopoly stranglehold that the Western world has on the banking financial system in the world. Russia, all, all these would remove the stranglehold that the US has on the international ec economic e economy. The U.S. is quite worried that in these circumstances, China's yuan could grow in importance. And this, as I think, is terrifying for them. Because of these issues, NATO is both hoping to bog Russia down, to bleed its economy white. It's the same type of mentality that happened in the Second World War when for four years they refused to open the second front against Hitler because they wanted Germany and Russia to fight themselves, exhaust themselves, and they subsequently will come to pick up the pieces. After all the joint, after all the joint resources of NATO countries, they feel that they could bleed Russia because the NATO countries economically are far stronger than Russia. And in military spending, Russia spent probably less than one-tenth of the joint NATO forces put together. So they think that they have good conditions in order to destroy Russia. I think what they have not calculated is probably the spirit of the Russian people. That is why I believe that the masses of the world's peoples must intervene. This cannot be left now to governments in their boardrooms. It cannot be left now into offices. Of course, those are important things for negotiation. But what is badly needed at this point in time is mass participation. Helga mentioned earlier about the massive demonstration we had in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s against um, American deployment of weapons in Europe. And we also saw that massive demonstration, uh, particularly in London, when, when the invasion of Iraq took place. I think we need to go back to, we need to start building in that way to try to get the intervention of masses of people into this activity. I do not think that there was a shortcut to this. Only mass activity now can hold back the, the, the aggressors and prevent what I believe would be a terrible war. There are some positive good hopes because we see in people stirring in Europe, demonstrations in Germany and France and Czech, Czech Republic, um, in other places uh, are good signs. But we do not, while, while in the United States, there are some positive signs too it has not developed into any kind of a mass movement. And that is, that is key, I believe, of what we're over at, where we should be focusing our attention because it is the United States that determines the actions of the NATO forces. It is where the United States goes, the rest will follow. I pointed out at the last meeting that even though um, the former chancellor of Germany Merkel was against NATO 
in uh, accepting or considering uh, Ukraine to be a member of NATO, she eventually caved in under the pressure of the United States. And therefore, some of what we're seeing, the, the, the more and more prominent figures coming out from the United States expressing their, their dissatisfaction with what is taking place and the actions of their government, the most recent being um, former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, um, who has taken a very laudable position in the interest of peace. But I believe now that we have to reach out to mass organizations like trade unions, like farmers' organizations, like peace organizations, some of them that have gone um, silent for many, many years. It's time we try to revive them. And as far as possible, the third world too, it's extremely quiet of what is happening. In some places, things are hardly reported, as in Guyana, it's hardly reported in our newspapers what is taking place in Ukraine and the, the serious dangers that face the world. I think that we have it in our responsibility to try to work with all other democratic forces to try to bring this danger to the masses of people and what it means for all of us if this continues to escalate. I don't have any more proposals than, than those that have already been made and what I've just said here, um, but I think we need action right now and to reach out to more and more people and to do our best to raise the alarm throughout the world. In Guyana and in the Caribbean, there's hardly any comment, if you look at the press, of any leaders in the region saying anything about what is, what is, what is taking place. And many, in many cases, when um, articles are written or, or letters are written to the press, about um, from the point of view of trying to bring the facts because the distortion is tremendous because you got to remember that we are exposed mainly to um, the news media from the United States, CNN, MSNBC, and um, that, that type of, of thing. So when some, some of us try to get our message out, the mainstream media um, is not carrying Sometimes don't even care our press, our articles, which tells you about the either they they are self censoring or they are being told not to not to take some of these positions. So I we need a joint effort at this point in time to raise the alarm of the dangers that we face. Because as I said, at least speaking about the Caribbean, I believe that the awareness of the danger. It lags way behind the rain, the real danger that exists. Um, that would be my contribution for the time being, and thank you very much for your attention. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ramatar. The idea of a mass participation in this entire effort is fundamental, and I accept as a born. Uh, American citizen, accept the challenge and the special responsibility we have here in the United States. We will be uh, hearing more uh, about that uh, from our U United States representative. The uh, final uh, presenter from this Latin American portion of the program is Senator Jorge Robledo from Colombia. There have been a few technical issues, I hope they have been solved. He has been a senator from 2002 to 2022, two periods. He uh, is the leader of the Dignity Party, he is architect and he's a teacher at the National University of Columbia. He is an economist and a promoter of the physical economic development of Colombia. He is also one of the seven members of the founding uh, group, and we would like to hear uh, Senator Roledo's words at this time. Uh, the floor is yours. Will you please unmute your microphone? Yes, I'm sorry. Well, first of all, I wanted to um, 
greet our uh, Mexican hosts, uh, Senator Benjamin Robles and Congresswoman uh, Maria Huerta, as well as Dennis Small, who has played a key role in uh, moving this initiative forward, as and all of you joining us today. We are now uh, walking into the ninth month of war, which is uh, ostensibly developing on Ukrainian soil, but it's much more complicated than that. This is a war that could uh, continue indefinitely, but could also uh, break out into a nuclear confrontation. Anyone who believes that this uh, will not, ca cannot uh, lead to a nuclear confrontation is uh, simply mistaken. Or uh, peace could be negotiated as we are promoting at this time, a peace process that would uh, extract us from this dire feature. Uh, in my case, I am moving in the framework of my party here in Colombia, the Dignity Party. So in that sense, when this conflict, we expressed our disagreement with the Russian decision to occupy Ukrainian territory. We have a principled position, which is that conflicts must be resolved peacefully and with respect to national sovereignty. This continues to be uh, the position that we hold. Yet, I, at the same time, I could also make a presentation here uh, expressing my disagreements with decisions of either of the uh, parties participating in this confrontation, particularly Russia and the United States, which, as we know, is also participating actively in the conflict. But I will not uh, delve into that area, because what I would like to uh, do is to make is a uh, convocation to peace, including in this uh, struggle, all of us who share points of view in that regard. The ideal um, solution would be to trigger a world mobilization against this war from participants from any of many different uh, points of view. Besides, this is a war that is developing in very painful conditions on Ukrainian soil, but the true the truth of uh, this confrontation is that it is taking place on that territory, but it is a confrontation between Russia on the one side and the United States and NATO on the other. That is the nature of the confrontation underway, which is leading to huge, enormous loss, beginning, of course, with the Ukrainians. The Europeans also are suffering severe social and economic consequences, and the entire world, in fact, here in Colombia, we are also feeling feeling the impact of this confrontation. For Just as one example, uh, the cost of uh, agricultural inputs and certain food pro uh, items. At times when Colombia and the entire world are in a global economic and financial crisis, is being exacerbated by this uh, conflict, and all of this may uh, lead to a global recession. We are seeing signs of this in Colombia. We, uh, it will be a global recession. And to further complicate um, this uh, tragedy for humanity, it is a war that could uh, escalate into a nuclear confrontation. This is There are many optimists that may think that such a war could produce a winner on one or another side, or that it could be settled outside of total nuclear confrontation. I truly doubt that either of these parties is strong enough to uh, vanquish the other, but I also, I'm also very pe uh, pessimistic about the possibility of avoiding a full out, an all out nuclear war, which would have absolutely catastrophic consequences for Ukraine, Russia, of course, but also the rest of the world. So this is the kind of war that must be pointed. Uh, we, we must say very clearly that it, there is no chance of winning it on either side. So we should adopt for this event a phrase that Gorbachev and Reagan adopted in their 1985 uh, agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States. They said literally, nuclear war 
cannot be won and should never be waged. Never won, never waged. This has to be uh, the has to become the call of uh, the sane majority of the world. Uh, Pope Francis has made this same call for a peaceful solution. What could end up happening? Well, it could be that they uh, continue to insist that this is a war that will have winners and losers, which uh, I repeat, I see no chance of that. But the other possibility is reaching through events such as this to trigger or produce some kind of uh, peace treaty among all of the parties involved, Ukraine and Russia, of course, but we must say uh, this should also include NATO. This is not limited to the two countries in whose uh, territory the, uh, the war is being waged. This uh, involves global uh, parts, parties. Of course, this will be very difficult. Let's look at the magnitude of this confrontation, but I, uh, believe together with Venice is that we need to find some sort of agreement that guarantees to each party that none of the other parties will uh, be uh, will, will reach uh, inequality, nuclear inequality with the other. We need to produce a nuclear guarantee uh, to every party that they will not be destroyed in a nuclear car. I know this is uh, difficult, but it is possible. So, and, and I need to bring up something we talked about in our uh, previous uh, conference, which had to do with a near nuclear confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union in uh, 1961. I'm sending an article that was sent by Julio Perez, who was a Lieutenant Colonel in Colombia. He was then a foreign minister and ambassador someone who is uh, very much uh, well, very well informed. And he titled this uh, article that was published here in Colombia, 60 years of the uh, missile crisis between the United States and Soviet Union. And the uh, uh, scenario was uh, the Cuban, and he put it this way, have we learned the lesson? So he tells a story and asks, have we learned the lesson? What is the lesson? We were on the verge of a nuclear war between the United States and so you very, very close. Troops were mobilized, missiles, warplanes, this infernal machinery went into motion. And fortunately at that time, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the uh, American head of state and uh, the Soviet head of state, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, were able uh, to uh, reach, uh, to, to, reach compromises uh, that made uh, an agreement possible, of course, with the collaboration of uh, Cuba. It's very important that we study this period, but it is a brief uh, way of uh, visualizing a different way, a different approach. And in conclusion, we need to draw in more political and social sectors to this uh, event. This is our second event and we are making progress. The third one will take place in a few weeks, but the goal is to make this grow into a universal demand, uh, uh, a clamor from people of every uh, different uh, point of view, ideology, all of us have, but we need to call all participants in this conflagration, but especially Russia, the United States, NATO, and of course, uh, Ukraine, to find a way out of this war and avoid the danger of nuclear war. This is diff we, there. Many people are interested. We need to find them. For instance, the Mexican president Manuel Lopez Obrador has made statements in this sense. The issue is to bring these voices all together and reach um, the momentum for a global mass movement. So, and that is something that we should decide democratically amongst each other, amongst ourselves, on a third event that will uh, open further the way for a uh, great uh, cry uh, and hue from the world for to stop the danger of nuclear war. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Robledo, for your words and your enthusiasm 
uh, with on the idea that this must grow as well as the uh, insistence that the danger of a nuclear war is all too real and the consequences would be absolutely catastrophic. This is what moves and motivates us. Now, having heard the different views from Latin America and the Caribbean, we will move on to the perspective of our European uh, partners. Our first presenter will be retired General uh, Dominique Delaward, uh, participating from France. He is a uh, graduate of the uh, prestigious uh, Santil uh, Military uh, School and War College, and he was a uh, French uh, attaché in Washington, in the French Washington, Washington, and he also was uh, present in Sarajevo as the uh, commander of the 7th uh, Alpine Infantry Battalion. Welcome, General Delawat. We are often told that peace must be achieved, should be achieved by means other than military, by negotiations, by more peaceful methods than armed conflict. I think that today it is uh, utopian to think like that. The world is not ready for that approach. Why? Because the world today is unbalanced, unbalanced militarily, economically, and socially between one hyper powerful country with its European vassals, that hyper hyper powerful country is the United States of America, which has the military strength and the economic power assets that it intends to use to rule the planet and to substitute itself if necessary to the United Nations. So there is an imbalance on this side. And we know that today the other countries cannot oppose this tyranny. The extraterritoriality of the dollar, the the omni powerfulness of the dollar and the extraterritoriality of American law. So all these measures and all these assets that the Americans have creates an unbalanced world and generate conflict. Uh, the strong one attacks the weak ones and want to impose its rule of the game. That's what we've seen on the planet since 1990 for 32 years. And if we don't remedy this imbalance, well, we won't get out of it. So in my opinion, there are two ways to restore an equilibrium. The first one is to remove the causes for the imbalance. That is to say, to get rid, to get rid in one way or another of NATO, which is one of the fundamental causes of the imbalance of the American hyperpower status, and in particular of the small mafia, which runs America, because America itself is not fundamentally bad. It is the small mafia, which runs the United States, which wants to preserve its advantages and its hegemony, which is bad. And then, of course, we have to try to oppose, try to remove this American imbalance, remove the dollar as the unique hegemonic currency, remove the extraterritoriality of American law, and from that moment on, the world would become balanced again. That said, one should not dream. Achieving such a thing is extremely difficult and extremely long, since it, since it would indeed take a long time. So for the moment, there's an, a second solution, which is to create, in in face of the American hyperpower, create another power comparable in economic and military power. And from that standpoint, and that as interstate organizations, such as the BRICS and the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, these two organizations 
in the long term can create an equilibrium with the American power and restore a kind of balance that will allow peace. If there's a balance, an equilibrium, peace will and can be achieved and it will be achieved through negotiation. If there's an imbalance, the strongest will always try to take advantage uh, of his strength to impose his views on the world and on others and we will not get out of the, an unbalanced world. So restoring a balanced world seems to me to be the number one objective. And one is actually easy to, to resolve. Today we have in Ukraine this war between Russia and Ukraine. In fact, it is not a war between Russia and Ukraine. It is a war that goes far beyond this simple European theater. It is a world war between globalism, people who want to keep a unipolar hegemony under the authority of the United States and NATO. And on the other side, there are those who want to try to keep their, their sovereignty, who are fighting today for a multipolar world. And Russia's fight in Ukraine is a fight for a multipolar world. It is a fight which thank God, is understood by a majority of states of the planet, whether they be in South America, Africa, or Asia. We feel that more and more countries are going to rally this multipolar world. And therefore, at one point or another, we will establish a balance with people who will be ready to negotiate because they will no longer have a choice. I mean, the globalists. The globalists are extremists, they will try to go to the limit. I hope they don't go over the limit because it will be very costly for the entire planet. But if they don't reach the limit, they will be forced to negotiate by a new equilibrium that will have been created in the world, an economic and military balance of power. And, and a, a financial balance as well the dollar will no longer reign supreme as an international law that will no longer be dictated by the United States, but will be coordinated by the United Nations. This is what I think Russia is trying to do. That's my, and that is why I am rather in support of this fight for multipolarity. I think we must help and support everything that goes in the direction of multipolarity in order to put an end to the U.S. hegemonic system that governs the world today. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, General de la Ward. Thank you very much, General de la Ward. Indeed, the world is uh, completely uh, divided. The issue for us is how to uh, establish a, a new balance to uh, end the this the unbalance. We need to end uh, the NATO and the hegemonic role of the dollar. In this uh, situation, the uh, city of London and uh, Wall Street, as a major economic and financial powers, are committing suicide by attempting to keep a speculative bubble of uh, $2 trillion that they have no way of um, uh, backstopping because we are facing, as I was saying, it's, it's uh, the essence of this military and economic crisis. In this moment, we have received a message from Serbia that I will read because Mr. Sivadin Jovanovic could not participate directly. From 2015 to date, Mr. Jovanovic has been president of the Belgrade Forum for a World of Equals. Established in 2000, the forum has organized dozens of national and international conferences promoting the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, equality, and non-interference in the internal affairs of other nations, 
it affirms that these principles are essential for peace, stability, and progress, and that globalization must not diminish the values of the dignity and identity of nations. In May 2018, the Belgrade Forum established the Silk Road Connectivity Research Center. Mr. Jovanovic is a former foreign minister and former member of Parliament of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, and this is his message. Mrs. Sepp LaRouche, dear conference organizers and international participants, the Belgrade Forum of a World of Equals wishes to express its support for your important international conference for world peace, stop the danger of nuclear war, this October 27, 2022. Your mobilization coincides with our own efforts for peace. We are deeply concerned regarding the worsening of the global confrontation, which is accompanied by a deep-seated economic and social crisis in Europe as well as worldwide. This crisis, which is worsening on a daily basis, constitutes a threat to global life, peace, and security. In our just-issued Belgrade Forum appeal to the world, we conclude, we appeal for the immediate dialogue and diplomatic action at the highest levels between Washington, Moscow, Beijing, and Brussels. The underlying focus can only be on peaceful coexistence between sovereign nations determined to prevent further worsening of the conflict, which could lead to a World War III scenario, without excluding nuclear incinerations. Recognition of equality, independence, and partnership in persevering peace, security, and development as indivisible civilizational values is the only way for the survival and secure future of humanity. Let us combine our efforts for a peaceful world focused on joint development of sovereign nations for the well-being of all mankind. With best wishes, Sivadin Jovanovic, Serbia, President, Belgrade Forum for a World of Equals. We thank Zivan uh, Jovanovic uh, for this message, which will undoubtedly become a significant part of uh, the uh, results of this proceeding. I am also very pleased to present a video message from Karl Krokel in Germany. He has been a he's uh, been a, a businessman for 33 years. In the last 20 years. He's been the Metallurgy Association of Dessau and has been the district uh, chief of uh, Artisans for Peace in Saxon-Anhalt over the last 15 years. In June, they um, issued a declaration to the German government, which is uh, spreading to other parts of uh, Germany. Uh, uh, Mr. Krokel, please uh, go ahead. My name is Karl Krökel, I'm the Kreishandwerksmeister of the Kreishandwerkerschaft Dessau Roslau Anhalt. I'm seit 33 years old. We have been on the 14th and 16th in a protest action to the protest action and we have sent a brief to the Obermeister to the Bundes Regierung geschickt under the motto Handwerker für den Frieden, in dem wir unsere Forderungen aufgemacht haben. Diese Forderungen stoppt Sanktionspolitik. Keine Waffenlieferung an die Ukraine, Friedenspolitik statt Kriegstreiberei, die haben aktuellen Bezug denn je. Es hat sich verschärft die Lage seitdem enorm. Das Kriegsgebiet ist ausgeweitet worden durch die, den Sabotageakt in der Ostsee. Die Lebensgrundlagen ganzer Generationen sind in Gefahr. Dagegen stemmen wir uns. Wir wollen auch nicht weiter als Kriegspartei hier hineingezogen werden und die NATO verlassen. Es muss ein Ende haben, diese sicherheitspolitische Gefolgschaft gegenüber den USA äh, und wir wollen eine europäische Friedensordnung. 
diesen sinnlosen, durch die EU ausgelösten Wirtschaftskrieg müssen wir jetzt als Bevölkerung und Wirtschaft tragen. Und wir stemmen uns mit aller Macht gegen hohe Energiepreise, wo in der Folge bei zehntausenden Betrieben die Lichter ausgehen werden und das Werk von Generationen, vor allen Dingen auch zukünftiger, völlig sinnlos vernichtet wird. Das stellt für uns eine riesige Bedrohung dar. Es geht um unser Leben als selbstständige Handwerker, unsere Bürgerinnen und Bürger. Und deshalb gehen wir auf die Straße und kämpfen weiter. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, señor Crockel. Y vieron ahí el, Thank you la... very much. As you saw in that last uh, still, uh, a scene of one of the many demonstrations taking place in Germany and other European countries. I uh, will uh, let you know that we are preparing a video of these demonstrations, which we hope to be able to uh, broadcast internationally. It is very important to uh, let the world know that Europe and specifically Germany are holding demonstrations for peace, ending sanctions, and re uh, promoting economic development. We will uh, put that uh, now in the background and uh, move on to a, a statement from uh, Italian uh, former parliamentarian Sergio Tancredi twice in 2012 and 2017 with the Five Stars uh, Party. When uh, this uh, party joined the Draghi government, uh, uh, parliamentarian Tancredi moved to uh, Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, the uh, party of the new Prime Minister, Giorgia uh, Meloni. He is a sovereignist in the European fra uh, framework, and he has experience in uh, teaching sports with poor uh, youths in Sicily, which uh, taught him the importance of uh, taking care of the least fortunate in the world. Uh, Mr. Tancredi, uh, please uh, go ahead. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Sergio Tancredi, outgoing member of the Sicilian Parliament. I thank those who made this initiative possible, and I'm happy to be able to contribute to this call, which I consider fundamental to stimulate the start of a peace process that until now has found too many obstacles on its way. Probably none of us had assumed that it would come to an escalation of this magnitude. But if we carefully analyze the last eight years of the situation in Ukraine, we find all the seeds of the present situation. Seeds of a disaster that have found fertile ground in the indifference of the public opinion, which being poorly educated, has not been able to foresee and try to stop in time the violent drift that we are experiencing today. It is clear that today it becomes secondary to say who is right and who is wrong. But it is undeniable that the escalation of the conflict today presents an aspect that can no longer be ignored and minimized. The possibility that the local conflict, due to the unwillingness of the dialogue of the conflicting parties, becomes a global conflict. This must confront us all with the realization that no one can say today that they are not involved in the conflict, because the ghost of a nuclear holocaust is more tangible and concrete than ever. In fact, we are playing with fire, a fire that would give no one on this planet a chance. Up to now, this conflict has been driven by both geopolitical and economic interests. It is not only a war between Russia, Ukraine and the West, but it is also a war for economic hegemony between the dollar and other currencies that are now appearing on the geopolitical chessboard, with frightening influences and pressures from corporations that have an interest in continuing the war for a long time, 
perhaps thinking that the new Vietnam in the heart of Europe eventually can turn into a very good business in many respects. But what business can be made if the war becomes a nuclear? I believe that this simple observation should ring an alarm bell in the minds of all leaders who have the ability to attack, suggesting to them that today it is necessary to act, finding the diplomatic way out of this nightmare by fully regaining control of actions by politics, avoiding the influence either by corporations that have economic interests in continuing this conflict, or by pride, that given the seriousness of this scenario, can only result in misjudgments. The time has come to silence the guns and give diplomacy a voice again, starting from a fundamental point, respect. Respect for the Ukrainians, but also respect for Russia and respect for the whole human community that today is in danger of extinction because of the short sightedness of a few who are unable to go beyond their partisan interests and do not realize that if we do not stop this destructive process, there will be no more interest but only a nuclear desert. It is necessary that the pressure for a peace process becomes very strong, enormous. It is necessary for each of us to do everything in our power to make sure the pressure reaches our governments. And it is necessary for each of us to mobilize as many people as possible so that this cry for peace becomes a sonic wave so strong that no one can ignore it. It is clear that if we have the ability and luck to stop the conflict, tomorrow's world will be a different world because it is glaringly obvious that the present process is splitting the planet into two blocks. It is up to us to prevent these two blocks for strictly economic reasons from starting a new Cold War in which we would probably all lose, primarily those theorists of globalization who would see their theories of domination shattered, swept away by a new but technically devastating scenario, economically speaking, first in the West, as it is already happening, but subsequently also for the rest of the planet. Paradoxically, those elites who are pushing today for the continuation of the conflict are precisely those who risk the most in all respects, and should have an interest in stopping the conflict and start a different, new, humanistic way of thinking. As a matter of fact, if the peace process will be a process based on respect for the legitimate interest of all parties involved, then I'm sure that the two blocks will have no reason for conflict, but will find ample room for cooperation in the interest of all, in the interest of the human race. This is the wish I made, and I sincerely hope that more initiatives like this one will arise, bringing reason to those who at this time have perhaps lost sight of what is the ultimate goal of our existence, creating a better future for our children and leaving them a better world. Thanks for listening. Gracias a usted, señor Tancredi, por su aporte. Thank you, Mr. Tancredi, for your intervention. I think at this point in our conversation, it's clear that both from Europe as well as the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, the link between the security crisis and the economic problems is a real and very deep one. When Mr. Tancredi makes a call for a, a sound wave to spread throughout the world. With this uh, Italian initiative, we can be very optimistic because if this uh, sound wave is uh, uh, inspired in the bel canto tradition in the classical culture of Italy, this will uh, be uh, most appropriate. The final 
European voice we will be hearing will be from uh, Antonio Ingroya. He is a very a famous judge and magistrate in the anti-mafia task force in Sicily. He worked with uh, Giovanni Falconi and Paolo Borsellino, who were murdered by the mafia. He ran for Italian prime minister in 2013 with the sovereign and popular Italy, which is struggling for peace and leaving NATO. He uh, was present many times in Mexico and Guatemala, uh, carrying out the UN's work against drug and organized crime. We now recognize uh, Senator Antonio Ingroia. Buongiorno, buon pomeriggio a, a tutti coloro che partecipano a questo importante... Good afternoon to all those who are participating in this important event, and thank you for inviting me. I am a jurist, and I have been an anti-mafia magistrate in Italy for many years. Today I am a lawyer, and I also do political work for a political movement called Italia Popolare e Sovrana, Sovereign and Popular Italy, that fights for peace. Greetings to the Mexican parliamentarians and former parliamentarians. I've been in Mexico many times involved in conferences and training activities in the fight against organized crime and for peace. I believe that the world is living today a terrible and very difficult moment because we are on the threshold of the Third World War. And this Third World War risks to become a nuclear war. And as many great thinkers of the world say and warn us, could even cause the extinction of our human species. We have before us the risk of a great nuclear catastrophe. I live in Italy, in the city of Rome, and we in Italy, as in all of Europe, are the most exposed to this risk of a nuclear war. Therefore, we must act immediately and start a peace negotiation. I think Europe has a key role. <laughs> Europe can make and must make the first move. With our NATO nuclear armament, we are in fact in danger of being directly involved in the conflict. And that's why we have to make an appeal to the Italian government. We have made an appeal to the Italian government that has just taken office. And we need to tell the Italian government and all governments in Europe and the world that it's time to take a step towards peace. How? First of all, a truce, an immediate ceasefire, all weapons should stop. And we should stop sanctions against Russia, since sanctions against Russia are a measure of war. Italy is at war. Italy must get out of this war and start its peace negotiation. I think Italy has to do it because of its history. I am very happy that there is a prestigious assembly of men and women from various parts of the world who have signed this appeal for peace. I join this appeal and so I give my thanks to everybody for this initiative and endorse your appeal for peace to move away from the risk of this nuclear spire. Adelante, with courage, I think uh, the idea of coraggio is a good one because as many of you know, those of us who have raised our voice to demand a negotiated uh, solution for peace and against nuclear war uh, have appeared in a list of the Ukrainian government's uh, committee to counteract uh, disinformation, as well as the uh, Mirat Boric's uh, list uh, of uh, uh, targets for assassination. Several uh, people appearing in this list uh, have already been murdered. And uh, 
li uh, people at this gathering have appeared in that list, and uh, most particularly Mrs. Uh, Zelga, Helga Zeppelarouche, who is the uh, first name um, that appears in that list. So this call for coraggio, uh, courage, means uh, very much to us. Now we will uh, entertain the uh, presentation from the United States by uh, retired Colonel Richard Vlach. He was the uh, head of the criminal section of uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, Pentagon, and he has been a state senator in the state of Virginia. Uh, senator Black is uh, well known for his uh, public calls against the uh, false uh, versions about the war in Ukraine, and his um, videos have been seen by millions of people in the uh, around the planet. I will quote, uh, make a quote from uh, something one one of these uh, uh, people said: "This you are a hero." Uh, this is uh, Colonel and Senator Black. I'm Senator Dick Black. I'm happy to be here with you this morning. Uh, let me get right into this. Here's where we are now. Uh, there are influential Republicans who have begun calling for reductions in aid to Ukraine and also for immediate peace talks to end the war. President Trump has called for talks and he says we have to avoid being dragged into World War III. He said the war never would have happened under his watch, um, but in any event, he wants, uh, he wants to end it now. The Pope has called for negotiated peaceful solutions to the, uh, to the war. And we had a fairly dramatic announcement. Uh, former Congresswoman uh, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, who uh, very, very prominent in the, in the Democrat party, and uh, a presidential candidate uh, resigned from the Democrats and she now denounced them as an elitist cabal of warmongers who are driving us into World War III. Republican minority leader Kevin McCarthy uh, has uh, announced that if Republicans win the House, that there would no longer be a blank check for money flowing over to Ukraine. He wasn't saying they were going to cut it off. He just said that uh, it was going to become much more closely scrutinized. Elon Musk, uh, sometimes the wealthiest man on earth, uh, has uh, tweeted a very excellent proposal for peace talks. I won't go into all of it, but it did include the United Nations moving into the contested areas um, and uh, conducting binding referenda to let the Ukrainians on the border vote and decide, do they want to remain in Ukraine or do they want to join Russia? And uh, uh, when he made this proposal, the Russians uh, very quickly said that they would agree that if, uh, if the United Nations conducted a plebiscite, a binding referendum, that they would abide by the uh, outcome, by the, the vote of the people, and that they would withdraw if that was the decision that the people made. On the other hand, though, the Ukraine angrily denounced any notion of self-determination for the people on the border. They know that these are Russian-speaking people they're ethnic Russians, and uh, they do not want to give them a choice of whether they want to uh, return to Russia or remain uh, with the Ukraine. Now, while this is going on, on the other side of the aisle, we have Democrat Senator Chris Murphy, and he said that he believes that if Republicans win either the House or the Senate, uh, that they will cut off all aid to Ukraine. I don't agree with him. I don't think that's uh, likely to happen, uh, but he's trying to obviously 
whip up uh, some some interest from among the globalists who who have a tremendous amount of wealth and, and power at stake in this war. Now, here's the thing. Strangely, uh, when Joe Biden uh, pushed through a an aid package for Ukraine, just a massive spending bill that uh, has $40 billion, half of it for, for actual weapons, not a single Democrat voted against this bill. Uh, Me- Media Benjamin, the co-founder of Code Pink, a radical Democrat anti-war group, said this, quote, we were flabbergasted that not one Democrat voted against the $40 billion bill for Ukraine, not even the squad or the progressive caucus. At the same time, 57 Republican conservatives did vote against this massive bill of arms for Ukraine. So you can see which direction it is. The, the Democrats are all in for war. The Republicans are having second thoughts. Uh, they say it's time for caution. We don't. We we can't afford to to be spending all this money there. Well, looking at this stark distinction in the in the two parties, uh, it smells to me like a political trap, and it really worries me a great deal. Now it's just two weeks before election day, and Republicans at this moment have tremendous momentum to retake both the House and the Senate. This is going to happen unless the Biden administration can pull off a very nasty October surprise to tip the elections. Now, the background of this is we've got Britain's Defense Secretary Ben Wallace just making a highly secretive, very extraordinary visit to Washington to talk uh, with Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and White House officials about shared security concerns. Uh, So secret that they couldn't be talked about on the the most secure uh, scrambled uh, telephone lines. There's a second defense minister, uh, James Heppe, uh, who said that the conversations with Wallace uh, would be beyond belief, that's a strange way to put it, beyond belief, suggesting that something both militarily and politically explosive was being planned. Uh, The Russians just released intelligence indicating that they believe that uh, Ukraine is about to to detonate a a nuclear dirty bomb. And uh, I fear that uh, that what they're saying is correct. It would tie directly in to the to the elections taking place, and I think their plan is to execute a dirty bomb detonation that will throw radioactive nuclear material over a radius of several miles. Uh, I believe that the plan is a false flag uh, intended to be blamed on Russia in order to inflame public opinion against Russia, just as the elections are are about to be held, putting the Republicans on the defensive because they have been calling for peace. Um, Now, it's important for everybody to just lean back and think of the logic of this. There's no circumstance under which Russia would do anything dramatic like this uh, just days before the election. Right now, uh, the party that that is more reasonable towards them, in their view, uh, is winning the election. It's got tremendous momentum. And anything that they would do would break that momentum and play into the hands of the Democratic Party, which is 100% opposed to uh, Russia and probably opposed to its continued existence as a nation. Um, so I think we, we face very, very perilous times. Uh, the Eurasian Times just published something. It didn't hit the, the Western media, but uh, there was a very extraordinary event that occurred uh, when a 
uh, U.S. Ohio class uh, submarine uh, surfaced in the Arabian Sea. This is a, a, uh, a secretive submarine that's armed with 20 ICBM nuclear tipped missiles. It was deliberately surfaced uh, in a very public way, disclosing its exact location and sending a clear signal that the U.S. is now fully prepared for nuclear war. This is nuclear saber rattling at its, at its highest level. And I believe it was done to inhibit Russia from responding to a possible dirty bomb attack uh, with some kind of a major response to target Kiev itself. Uh, America has never been at greater nuclear peril than it is today. Uh, we certainly have mad men in charge, both in the U.S. and in the U.K. Uh, I just think, I think we all need to be very alert for uh, things that may happen within the next few days leading up to the election. Uh, we need to be aware that there's, logically, there is no way that Russia would do anything that would upset this election at this time. So uh, I, I wish you all the best. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're faced with, uh, uh, with a very risky time. Thank you for having me on this morning. Bueno, muchas gracias, uh, Colonel Black, Senator Black. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Colonel and uh, Senator Black. I believe that uh, your words can um, illustrate for people why your words have had such resonance, because not only uh, in the United States, but in uh, the rest of the world, it is very important to know that uh, there are voices of sanity in the United States very much against the danger of war developing. I uh, would like to take the opportunity to state the obvious, uh, which is we have extended the time because of the growth of this discussion. We can solve this quite easily. First of all, we will be uh, extending the time for this uh, session because I believe it is very important that we have at least an hour for discussion once the presentations are finished. And secondly, I'd like to announce that we will have a third uh, meeting uh, in, broken into two sessions. Our second presentation from the United States comes from Diane Sayre, who is a candidate for uh, for the to the U.S. Senate for the state of New York. Uh, she is from the uh, she's an independent for La Rouge. She is um, contesting the uh, Senate seat of uh, Chuck Schumer, who says he is a representative of the people, but he is a representative of the globalists. Uh, Diane is a uh, recognized uh, candidate, and it is still in doubt whether she will be allowed to participate in a public debate among the uh, established uh, candidates. Uh, it is clear that they do not want her to participate, and you will understand exactly why, what they team, uh, when you, what, what they uh, fear when uh, they, you hear her th at this time. Uh, Sen uh, candidate Sarah, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who has spoken, and particularly Helga Zepp LaRouche, for making the initiative that we have to create this alliance for one humanity of many voices from many nations. It's my personal view that if more people had experience playing in a symphony orchestra or singing in a chorus, that they might recognize that it's per it's possible to have perfect integrity of your unique role and create something which is far greater and more beautiful than the sum of its parts. I um, appreciate particularly uh, General Delaward for recognizing that the policies of the United States don't represent even remotely a majority view of the population. I think that's why the censorship has become so pronounced, uh, the efforts to silence my voice in this campaign, no exception to that. 
but a small cabal. And I will tell you that my biggest concern is the lack of conscience of this cabal. Uh, and I think you can go back uh, we to Vietnam with the use of napalm and Agent Orange uh, to consider whether the warnings that were expressed uh, by Dr. Ondarza earlier today on the question of chemical and biological weapons, and which I know are being discussed widely in Russia, also pose a very real threat as real or perhaps more real than the threat of nuclear war. When you see things like um, what happened with the Nord Stream pipeline, it makes you wonder how much pain and suffering they are willing to inflict even on people that they normally would consider their allies. Now, I am hopeful because I think we have begun to see a potential for moving uh, the so-called elected officials of the United States, as we saw in this past week. And I'm just going to show you a few things. I think everyone here probably saw the exchange that two of my volunteers uh, and longtime LaRouche organizers, Jose Vega and Kine and Thistlethwaite had when they confronted Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on her repeated funding for war with Russia, arming Ukraine and the danger of nuclear war. Um, and what I consider partly a result of that. So I'm just going to go to a couple of slides here. Um, first of all, uh, some of you may be interested. This is one of my billboards. Uh, this is in Queens, New York on a major highway, Northern Boulevard. And there's another one in the Gowanus Expressway, which is Brooklyn where Schumer uh, lives. And uh, there's a third, crossing the Manhattan Bridge that says, why is Schumer afraid to debate Diane Sayre? Um, and it has had, I think, a rather uh, powerful effect. So as you may know, a few days after this exchange between Jose and Kynan with AOC, this letter came out. It's dated October 24th from 30 congressmen saying here, given the destruction created by this war for Ukraine and the world, as well as the risk of catastrophic escalation, we also believe it is in the interest of Ukraine, the United States, and the world to avoid a prolonged conflict. For this reason, we urge you to pair the military and economic support the United States has provided to Ukraine with a proactive diplomatic push redoubling efforts to seek a realistic framework for a ceasefire. Okay, and this is just the end of that. We agree with the administration's perspective that it is not America's place to pressure Ukraine's government. I'm not going to read it all, but you get the, in conclusion, we urge you to make vigorous diplomatic efforts. This is hardly um, a very strong letter. It in no way criticizes Biden. But immediately, there must have been such a freak out, including from Schumer, I'm sure, because he is the Senate majority leader. He is the enforcer of the Democratic Party, that within hours, one of the Congress uh, congresswomen put out this statement, uh, just clarif quote unquote clarifying, uh, saying that um, in a letter to President Biden today, my colleagues and I advocated for the, this is the same day, that's how fast it happened, advocated for the administration to continue organ to continue ongoing military and economic support for Ukrainians while pursuing diplomatic support. Diplomacy is an important tool that can save lives. Well, that wasn't even enough. So the next thing you know is they take it down, and this is not from um, Jayapal, but another congresswoman in the Progressive Caucus claiming Timing and diplomacy is everything. I signed this letter June 30th. A lot has changed since then. I wouldn't sign it today. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, I find this um, rather amazing. 
absolutely amazing that so quickly, not only do they drop it, but they all pretend as if they had nothing to do with it and it was just a mistake that it got released. I don't know if someone's threatening a nuclear war uh, in the Congress, but it, it appears that that might be the case. Um, now, that is not everybody, and uh, Senator Black did reference this, I believe, that um, Congressman Gosar in Arizona now has taken a stand. He issued a letter the following day, I think, seeing this uh, to both Putin and Zelensky offering that Arizona could be the location for negotiations uh, between the United States and, I mean, I should say the United States, but Ukraine and Russia. So clearly there is an opposition Clearly, it is actually the case, which I was wondering about myself, that the Congress is capable of responding to the American people, but that at the moment, the perception is that this treasonous cabal of pro-great um, global reset financiers has more power than the people. And therefore, I think that the work of this group that we are pulling together is extremely important in that context. And I will end my remarks there and look forward to the uh, dialogue. Bueno, muchas gracias, Diane. Well, thank you, Diane, sir. Indeed, there is a huge fight in the United States, which is not reflected in the media. There are sectors that are um, coming forward. And uh, when uh, they and we uh, attempt to communicate with them, they are threatened. So this uh, fight that we are waging in the United States and with Ukraine's campaign is an essential component of what we're doing. As a famous uh, Mexican broadcaster, radio broadcaster says, don't leave yet, the, the good part is just starting. We have fresh information that a video has come in from Germany and we will play it. It comes from uh, the Dorin uh, Kummer from the uh, Forum for Freedom and Democracy. They are the ones who organize the big demonstrations in uh, Germany. We will uh, play this video now. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Maureen Schimmler, and I am 42 years old and mother of three children. I live in Plauen in Germany. If one wants to describe the current situation in Germany, one does not really know where to begin. I will try anyway. Everywhere, people are taking to the streets by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. They are driven by existential fears, by fears for the future. They are driven by anger and despair, anger and despair concerning a government which me by means of decisions, actions and clear breaches of election promises is quite obviously opposing its own citizens entrusted to its care. People fear not only abandoned by the federal government, but betrayed. People are in an uproar about being forced to freeze even at work and at home, or the politicians afford to build themselves in Berlin, a lavish new building for a planned 770 million euro, which has already cost half a billion euro and is to be inflated now to a gigantic extent, which when finished will exceed the White House and the Elysee Palace. Huge financial transfers abroad, for example, to Ukraine, a waste of taxpayers' money, billions invested in armaments, while there is nothing left for education and health care let people to oppose and no longer put up with all of this. Companies are going bankrupt due to the immense price increases. Employees are losing their jobs and the livelihood that goes with it. There is no money for our old people and for the children. The sanctions policy is inflicting enormous and perhaps even irreparable damage on Germany, turning a once progressive, innovative and rich country into a rubble heap.
Die Menschen haben Angst. Sie haben Angst vor Jobverlust. People are afraid. They are afraid of losing their jobs, of impoverishment, afraid of expropriation. And above all, people are afraid of war. The word peace echoes across all of the streets in Germany at demonstrations, rallies, vigils. It can be read on placards, play flyers, posters, t-shirts, stickers and buttons. The little word peace, which means everything to all of us and decides everything. Peace is the highest and most valuable thing to strive for worldwide. And I think that I can speak for all people when I say peace is the only important thing that we should bring about and leave to our children. The institution of citizen protests itself is finding a new platform these days based on a brutal threat of war and nuclear extinction. The, peop the great people, the organizers and hosts of civic protests, peace movements, rallies, demonstrations and vigils are attacked, defamed, discredited in their job-related and private sphere and sharply criticized, first and foremost, by a large part of the press. And yet, or precisely because of this, these people stand firmly together. They organize, connect and network and work together to develop solutions and peace plans. And this is also the motivation of the Forum for Democracy and Freedom to which I belong. Like the entire movement, we all have one common goal peace in Europe. And there are clear demands Germany-wide for this. The immediate commencement of diplomatic talks, the safeguarding of peace, the drawing up and implementation of a peace plan, an immediate haul to all arms deliveries, referendums, and thus a real say for the citizens, securing and strengthening the economy, a real freedom of speech, a real freedom of the press, and the rolling back of all corona measures. For this, the people here in Germany stand together day and day in the streets for a livable and peaceful future, for peace. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, message uh, by uh, from the uh, peace movement in Germany, which are extending uh, not from Germany into other European countries who face a uh, cold and ruthless uh, winter uh, due to the absurd and insane uh, sanctions measures. The final present presentation will come from Mr. Uh, George Ku from in the United States. He uh, was born in China, came to the United States, joined the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he is a international uh, business builder. He has written on the strategy, a business strategy towards uh, China. He's a strong promoter of business uh, relations with uh, China, and he is also a uh, contributor at, with uh, Asian Times. Uh, Hello there. Please go ahead, Thank Mr. Ku. Me in this conference. My name is George Ku. I'm a retired international business consultant, and I post my commentating on uh, online Asia Times. Avoiding nuclear warfare is crucial to the survival of the world civilization. It's now even more urgent than ever. I'm aware that the principal subject of concern in today's conference is how to temper down the temperature uh, on Ukraine. And many will speak on this matter. I would just like to point out that the United States is also promoting a military conflict in the other side of the world, specifically between Taiwan and the mainland China across the Straits, less than 100 miles apart. Since the Vietnam War and the ignominious retreat from Afghanistan, and Iraq, Washington's goal to dominate the world has not wavered, but has revised its strategy. The Biden administration is now actively initiating conflict in such a way that they can convince some other party to do the fighting for them. The Zelensky government is one such participant in a proxy war in Ukraine on behalf of Uncle Sam. In Asia, 
Taipei government headed by Tsai Ing-wen has been nominated to light the match. It's obvious that the United States is deadly serious. Nancy Pelosi, her drop-in visit in early August was a test of Beijing's determination whether they're, re they're ready to defend China's sovereignty and the principle that Taiwan is part of China. Since then, Washington is increasing sale of arms to Taiwan, increasing military presence on the island, ostensibly to train the Taiwanese troops to fight, and increasing high-ranking officials visiting Taipei to assure the government there that Uncle Sam is ready to back them up and to fight along with them. Most commentators on Taiwan don't believe that the U.S. will defend China, Taiwan in the event of an inv invasion by the PLA. They believe it is the American ploy for Taiwan to weaken China by fighting down to the last Taiwanese standing, similar to the scenario in Ukraine. Many in the DPP, the power, root party in power headed by Tsai Ing-wen, are also dubious of Biden's pledge. But because they're unwilling to admit that Taiwan is part of China, they have no basis to explore a peaceful negotiation across the straits. Therefore, they have no choice but to go with the party line that Americans are ready to shed blood on behalf of Taiwan. Even though the UN and more than 140 countries, including the US and their allies, all recognize that Taiwan is an integral part of China, Washington is now seeking ways to renege on this agreement. A new Taiwan Relations Act, now widening through the U.S. Congress, includes the recognition of the sovereignty of the island of Taiwan. In other words, no longer officially a part of China. If enacted and signed into law by President Biden, it will be tantamount to a declaration of war on China. Considering that Biden is willing to destroy the global semiconductor industry, including America's own companies in Silicon Valley, just to stop China from making any further progress to advances in chips, he has already expressed his personal intention to go to war. His strategy seems to depend on Taiwan becoming the front line when hostilities begin. I'm not so sure the people of Taiwan will be such willing foil. I'm also not sure that the PLA would fire the first blow against Taiwan. Beijing sees Taiwan as part of China, the people of Taiwan as compatriots. Instead of a proxy war, the PLA may simply go direct against the protagonist and just take out the U.S. naval naval vessels in nearby waters. How such escalation proceeds or will proceed is anybody's guess. Both China and the US are nuclear powers. The outcome is just too horrifying to contemplate. I hope the outcome of this conference is to send another message to Washington that war is never a solution, but peace is for all the people in the world. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Ku. It is uh, very important to include the uh, uh, topic of China in this discussion, even though it has not been our main uh, focus of attention, we uh, have agreed that this is uh, a very important uh, issue to include in our conversations. And that is where we will be going now. The discussion of uh, not all, but some of the panelists who have uh, uh, made statements so far will be joined to uh, 
attendees who have uh, been present so far. Another one of our attendees, Dr. Um, Kirk Megu, will be joining the discussion. I would also like to uh, mention for this discussion that we have received a very important additional message from uh, Germany. Des de Rugermer, he is a uh, interventionist a philosopher that is an activist, and he says we thank or we welcome the uh, efforts that you are uh, carrying out. I appreciate this uh, meeting of uh, the respectable meeting of many political leaders of many countries, and we welcome him. Now, as I say, in this, we, we have uh, extended uh, the time for discussion, which uh, the original uh, time is uh, almost up, but we have decided to extend it so that uh, both attendees and panelists uh, will respond uh, first to some of the specific questions that have been made here. This uh, meeting has been not only uh, to uh, bring uh, denunciations and information, but also to make uh, proposals. And I would, first of all, like to request of Mrs. Helga Zeplerush to respond uh, to these uh, issues as well as uh, Congressman Benjamin Robles, if you also can uh, also participate. Uh, Mrs. Zeplerush, uh, please go ahead. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to thank all of the people who have contributed to this very important dialogue. Um, and I'm also very happy that I heard from many people a commitment to help to expand this. Um, I met a lot of different ideas and proposals were made. I think uh, what uh, Congresswoman Huerta referred to is actually a work in progress. Uh, we had several discussions about actually working on a plan how such a you know a new new system could could look like in terms of economics giving the right for economic development to every single person on the planet. Uh, overcoming poverty as the absolute driving force, setting up financial institutions which are making that possible and are not um, giving the right of the speculators and many other things. So we will continue on that. And uh, I would actually invite people to you know, share also in a written form uh, proposals until we have the next event, which we plan at this point to have sometimes in November. Uh, maybe other people can <clears throat> can also comment uh, on that. But I also, you know, would like to, you know, discuss this a little bit with the General de la Varte because, you know, I think I like the idea of, of that we need a multipolar world. But one of the main concerns um, I had, and we have discussed at many previous Schiller Institute conferences, that we multipolarity is obviously better than unipolarity, but it does still have the danger of a geopolitical confrontation. And therefore, I think that the new system which is emerging with the BRICS, the SCO, the European Eurasian Economic Union, and other organizations of the Global South, also working together with the BRI, um, it's good that China and others have uh, expressed repeatedly that these are open for uh, join, being joined by European or even the United States, uh, you know, in order to set up really a new system. Now, because the problem is if you don't move beyond, um, you know, to have two blocks, which at this point is the intention of many forces in the, in the West, the US government, the British government, the EU, they all are encouraging not only the decoupling from Russia has already pretty much occurred, but now they are making enormous pressure to reduce the dependency on, on China. 
um, that does not work. I think we need to organize people also inside the United States and Europe uh, to actually make that evolutionary step to think about the one humanity first. And I think that the survivability of mankind probably depends on our ability to catalyze such a change. That That is what I wanted to say and maybe more later. I hope it is so. Thank you, then. Congressman uh, Robles is uh, still available to participate in our discussion. And uh, if he would like, he does have his uh, uh, official responsibility, but if he would like to make any comments before he leaves, uh, Otherwise, I think uh, that uh, role would uh, uh, befall uh, Congresswoman uh, Huerta for any congressman. Uh, congresswoman uh, Ms. Huerta, will you, will you please use the uh, headset? I'm sorry. Indeed. We can hear you now. Great, fine. Now we can hear you. What I was saying is that I think that Congressman uh, uh, Robles is uh, in ch in the in Congress. He, there, there is a uh, session at this time, and he is uh, on the floor. But I wanted to say something briefly. In first, in the first place, to amplify somewhat uh, Helga's comment. And that is that uh, looking forward uh, to the next event, we should think of a concrete commitment to putting together a team of sorts that might uh, assemble a network of organizations. I could, for instance, with your help and uh, people here in Latin America to um, make a network of networks or a group of organizations that will step forward to defend world peace in Latin America. And I see also uh, we have uh, partners in Europe, but I would refer also to participation in citizen uh, mo mobilizations. And what uh, Congressman uh, Montoya uh, was saying is that, that the same could be um, done with uh, networks of uh, legislators or legislators, Peru, Ecuador, for instance, we expect that uh, President Lula will soon uh, be in office, also Argentina, uh, to the effect of uh, addressing legislators and uh, government uh, functionaries to directly uh, to establish a legislators, a world network of legislators as well as organizations fighting for world peace. But this would um, uh, commit commit us, I'm thinking, for instance, in the Latin, case of Latin America, that I would get in touch with our uh, Colombian uh, partners, as well as uh, friends and contacts in Guyana, Bolivia, and uh, uh, attract uh, leaders of these organizations and governments to participate in this network. And this, uh, to follow up somewhat or further develop Helga's ideas, a kind of a directory of leaders and organizations that will be join, joining. That's on the first, uh, first and also uh, addressing active legislators uh, as currently in office who will also be joining this conglomerate or uh, of legislators and former legislators. I would be glad to uh, run that, but not only in Latin America, but also in Europe, that anyone, someone there would also take that responsibility for the European continent. And finally, that we seek, and this, of course, would have to do with resources available to us, seek to 
um, have a meeting, uh, and I I would like to uh, travel personally to either Europe or Latin America to meet. Eventually, yes, in in Zoom, yes, but eventually also uh, in person with the leaders of these organizations. In the case of the uh, civic uh, citizen mobilization, that is also as well as the uh, legislators with whom we would establish a more solid and direct uh, link. I believe that the most important task of each of us here participating in this event is that we are truly able to activate any organization that we are in communication with on the importance of the initiative of stopping this war. That would be my suggestion for the time being. Very well, thank you. So you will be not only a uh, representative, but also an ambassador, and I feel this is most uh, appropriate. We will uh, continue with this um, exchange. As you, as uh, Dr. Mehu is uh, doing, you can raise your hand digitally. There is a uh, icon for that on your screen. But before um, we give the floor to Dr. Megu, I would like to read two very important messages that also just came in. First of all, there is a statement signed by uh, mayors in France, current uh, city mayors supporting a resolution by uh, the uh, City Council of Strasbourg, Germany for peace. The, the, I will read some, the, the letter is not that long, but I will read some experts. We, mayors of France, in support of elected uh, officials in the German city of Stalford and their efforts to uh, convene discussions on the Ukraine issue uh, affair, we say the following. War is a calamitous matter that depends on the will of men. It is necessary and urgent for the nations of Europe to express themselves uh, to humanity and stop the military, the life of every woman and child and man in Europe obliges us to do this. As representatives elected by the people, our first obligation is to preserve peace. The uh, town council of Stalsen in Germany is giving us an example of this. On, on every side of the uh, political spectrum, including the so-called extremes. Therefore, we publicly express our support to the uh, decision of uh, uh, 20th October 2022 and a call on Germany, uh, on France to join the call for a dialogue between the belligerent parties. And it is signed by five French mayors, the mayor of Chila, Patrick Fing, Edek Chamouti, Eugène Perez, uh, sir from Monton and Diapre Le Petit, Patrick Mombo, and for the uh, town council of the Pusan, Julie Perreal. Uh, and you will forgive uh, uh, my terrible pronunciation of uh, the French uh, names and uh, cities, uh, but this is a, was extremely important to share. Uh, we will now uh, turn to Dr. Megu. Uh, Dr. Megu, uh, please go ahead. It's uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me properly. Um, it, it's it's a pleasure being at this second um, uh, se second convening of this grouping, and in the spirit of putting forward and a uh, concrete proposal. Uh, I want to forward something that builds on all the excellent suggestions that everybody has made before. Um, and, and let me just get straight into it. I think we all agree that the, and, and it's objectively proven, you don't have to even agree, it is a fact that the existing structures, especially the UN, they failed to prevent war 
and they cannot prevent the, the push toward nuclear Armageddon and World War III. So I, I endorse, and, and we all, I believe, endorse Helga Zeppelin-Russia's call that we need to have a new security and development architecture for the world. So what I'm proposing is that all possible existing groups, and I mean here, um, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the G77, the BRICS, ASEAN, CARICOM, uh, CELAC, the African Union, et cetera, et cetera. There are all these international groupings, uh, of a significant groupings, and maybe even bodies within the UN system like UNIDO or UN ECLAC or UNCTAD or UNDP or UNESCO, in which um, uh, the, the mass uh, of uh, the majority of the world population um, have much more say and control. And also uh, pulling in people like uh, what Senator, Senator Black um, mentioned, like Donald Trump, Tulsi Gabbard, the Pope, Elon Musk, that all these groups come together to endorse a restructuring of the UN system to prioritize security and development. And the, these endorsements would be based on the ideas here that we present, and also the many suggestions for reform that have been made over the past six decades from the new international economic order in the 70s, and even from before that about reform of the system that has stalled and purposely stalled, uh, you know, ever since the decolonization of Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. So we need to revitalize and step up that decades old movement because we are the majority. And the mass mobilization suggested by former president Donald Rambutar definitely has a role in this because the G7 cannot continue to hold the world to ransom and to continue their anachronistic racist roles as self-appointed imperial leaders of the world. You know, they only do so because we let them. They don't have the economic power. They don't have the military power. They only have our willingness to allow that old order remain. So at the same time, as we push towards this, because we know this has been a problem, we can also build this sort of alternative UN, this UN2, if you want to call it, which was suggested by the first presenter. So, so we can build a new one, re try to reform the old one, and then also uh, uh, mobilize the mass movement based on a single document that could come out of this. And our grouping here can lead that movement and be the vanguard. So that is my proposal. Sí, absolutamente. El papel del Caribe en esto es... Absolutely. The role of the Caribbean in all of this is fundamental, as we've heard already from uh, Mr. Ramotar and now Mr. Megu as part of this international effort. If you uh, would, uh, anyone who would like to make a comment at this time, you can raise your hand on the screen. Or And we also have questions that have come in online, but if any of the panelists or those who have already spoken would like to make further comment at this time. We'd like to uh, give you the floor. I see Helga has uh, raised her hand. Please go ahead, Helga. Uh, I I did not, but I can I can respond anyway. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> actually, I wanted to underline a little bit more the uh, motion by the French uh, mayors because they address themselves to a very important initiative, which is the practically all the parties of the city of Stralsund, uh, the factions in the city council, except naturally the Greens, who are the war party, but all the other parties basically uh, offered the mayor's house and the house of the city council of Stralsund to be the place of peace negotiations you know, between Russia, uh, the United States, uh, Ukraine. And they refer in particular to the historic event in 1370, when that city already mediated the war between Denmark and the Hanse. The Hanse was this trade club, you know, which is, was in all the major ports. So this is very important because here you have the citizens of a very important historic town uh, referring to their tradition to bring in the idea that if all the leaders of the world are not capable of uh, bringing peace negotiations. Here we are, the citizens of the city of Stralsund. So in a certain sense, it's like what the uh, U.S. congressman from Arizona, Goza, did 
did by offering uh, uh, you know, Arizona as the place of neg negotiation. And I think if many, and I fully agree with Kirk uh, McGoo, that you know we have to catalyze really the excitement. This is a war which can be won. Um, because you know nobody has the right, not NATO, not the military industrial complex, nor any any force on the world to do what they are doing. I mean, they're, they're, you know the whole debate about using nuclear weapons as if that would be a, a gentleman um, mistake or something, you know, th that is irresponsible. And you know, if you look at the mass stream media in the last period, they are discussing you know, the possible use of tactical nuclear war to have a regional nuclear war, as if this would be just something like a, a children picnic. Uh, and I think we have to really get people out of this lethargy because you know the problem is that, as uh, uh, Mr. Ramota was saying, that the media in the Caribbean are not even reporting about what's going on. So how, how should the people of the world even know how much their life is in danger. So I, I really would like to appeal to all the participants in this um, discussion that we should go out of this, you know, with uh, Congresswoman Huerta's proposal. I think if she will be the spearhead for the legislators, we need other organizers who will be the spearhead to help us to contact all the organizations in the world in the shortest period of time to really catalyze such a world movement out of the ground because no time is to, 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 to be lost. Yes, indeed. We have a very uh, welcome competition between Stelson and uh, the state of Arizona and the United States, as Helga uh, pointed out. I'd like to report that the Office of Congressman Hugo Sar uh, received from us the invitation to participate in this uh, conference or send a message. And uh, referring cordially to their uh, press release already published. So uh, things are moving in that direction. Unless there are further uh, comments from other participants at this time, I would like to address, uh, to bring up a question that was addressed, I believe, particularly to uh, Mr. Uh, Ramotar uh, from Guyana, as well as General uh, Delaware uh, from France, because it has to do with uh, what is happening internationally. And they are, I'm getting the rug pulled out from under me a little bit here with the different questions coming in. But the question is, first, do you believe that the, this is from Juan Marto Dano from uh, Venezuela, a journalist, what uh, repercussions would the coming uh, meeting of the group of 20 in Indonesia to uh, reduce the risk of uh, nuclear war coming from the Ukraine-Russia? Uh, the conflict. And a question also from Spain, which is the following. How can we talk to the Anglo-Saxon leaders of the city of London and the United States? Because this is a group where all the wars and evils come from. We need to speak to them urgently, explain to them everything that we are saying that, uh, that to these people who wish to reduce the uh, number of people in the world. So these are two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, perhaps Mr. Ramatar would like to answer. Yeah, okay, I will, I will try to. But um, before I do that, I want, want to comment um, very quickly on the on some of the remarks made by um, your, your the contributor, um, American Chinese contributor who spoke about what was happening in Taiwan and China. I believe that, that, um, that if the NATO succeeds in what is happening in Russia, then definitely China will be a target for attack on the next, on the next issue. I believe that China is actually 
they, I strongly believe that China is the main objective of some of these things that are taking place. Because I agree fully with our French friend who made the point that um, part of the problem is the imbalance that exists within the world. I would put it probably in a little bit different way. I think it's a, it's a battle in some ways of, of the old, the trying to preserve its life and preserve itself. And it is still extremely strong to try to prevent the emergence of a new system. And that new system seems to be taken, China seems to be, uh, although Ch China does not want to, to accept that, but people are seeing more and more China in that role that the, 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 the development over the last 40 years have been so tremendous. Its example is becoming more and more um, important in the world. And China, if, becoming a symbol, they, despite the fact that Chinese leaders are very careful not to say that, um, that, that China is, is emerging as anything that to challenge anybody. China is speaking about peace all the time. But I think that is part of what, what is taking place in, in the world at the moment, at this kind of, um, this kind of struggle between the, the, the old, and that is why they, it has been a big shift in the attitude towards China over the last decade or so. When China was seen as being a source for cheap labor and so forth, investment was encouraged to go into those directions. Now China has reached beyond uh, um, a certain level. There's desperate attempt to try to hold back China in technology and in, there's a lot of attacks on China in, in, within the third world and in the world as a uh, whole. So I think that that is um, part of the, um, the, the thing that we're seeing. Um, I agree that we have, to, we have to use every single tool we have. I don't think that we can give up any type of, uh, any type of leverage or possibility that we have. It, it should not be one action uh, against another action. It should be how much we can, how much we can use all possibilities. And one of the one of the um, one of the things I think that we should find try to find a way to lobby some of the powers in the world, both uh, and 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 to try to get more voices being heard in a more specific way. I mean, the the, the colleagues in the United States are under a lot of pressure but within the within the world itself the power of america is so great that a lot of people are not being explicit to call out what what is um what is happening um so i think that we should not rule out any form of activity um both at the level of creating parliamentarians and and, and all that type of activity um and 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 so forth. And I I don't believe that we should look at this issue or this this one meeting will change everything. I think that this is a process, and we should continue to build on it. And that is why I'm happy to hear that you will have a third meeting, and then we can probably generate ideas. How do we move? I don't think anyone got all the answers in their heads, but as we discuss and and generate ideas, I think we can find ways of means that we can make an impact. But time is not on our side, um, as I would say, and we got to do whatever possibility we have, small as it may be, we have to take some steps to bring people's attention, to alert people's attention to the dangers that exist. Um, I don't know if I've answered the question. Is there anything specific more you want to think for me to address? I'm, I'm not sure if I grasped, been able to grasp the whole question uh, correctly. I think that your contribution to the discussion is very useful. General Delavard, uh, if you please, um, do you have any comments or answers to these questions or any comment? Uh, you would, would you please unmute your microphone, General? If the General would please unmute his yeah, you microphone. Have, you have it? Do you have the, do you hear me? Yes. So I, I will try to, 
to practice to practice my uh, English, my poor English. Uh, first of all, the question of uh, G20. G20 now is uh, divided because uh, you know you have uh, one part is uh, G7 plus, and the other part is uh, multi multipolar world uh, fan. Uh, you have two parts in a, the J7 are behind the United States uh, wanting to establish the, to maintain the current uh, international order uh, under the hegemony of uh, US and NATO. On the other side, you have uh, in uh, the J20, you have a, a, a decent uh, country of uh, maybe 10, 10 countries which are on the other side. So I don't think we will have any results for the peace in Ukraine going out of uh, the J20. So the, I don't think even if, but I don't think that will happen even if Biden uh, meet with uh, Putin. And I am not sure that he is uh, really able to meet Putin, uh, physically able to to deal with Putin. The so second second question was uh, asked was uh, about the possibility to discuss with these uh, globalists who want to reduce uh, to reduce the uh, population of the world. You know, I don't think these people are people who can you can discuss with. You cannot discuss with these people. They have an objective. They are very powerful people. They they have the medias. They built uh, public opinion in the world. They have uh, uh, military power. They have uh, economic power. They have the dollar. They have the law of uh, of the U.S., so they have almost everything on the, on their side, and they will try to to push and uh, to push at at the end of the game. But my the good news is that in behind the appearance, these people are not as powerful as they believe they are. I, I try to explain. Uh, these people, uh, first of all, if, if they want, if they have the ability to do something uh, to win the war, if NATO was able to win this war, NATO will be already in war See, uh, will uh, engage this war uh, three or four or six months ago. If they don't do, and uh, if they refuse to enter in war against Russia, it's because they know they will lose. That's simple. Why they will lose? I know very well the US armed forces. I have been uh, three years in the US in the middle of these, uh, of these uh, armored forces, I have, uh, I have three years to observe everything. And uh, I can tell you that today, they are not able to win this war, including a nuclear war is uh, if that uh, occurred. You know, a nuclear war is not, uh, we have been prepared when, when I was young, uh, the nuclear weapons were always in all our exercises. We were, uh, we were supposed to receive nuclear, uh, tactical nuclear uh, bombs on our units. So we, we were prepared to that. To, to this uh, kind of war. But the nuclear war is four, four elements. First of all, you have the nuclear bombs 
which are now almost in parity between Russia and, uh, and the US. So no problem on this side. Second, you have the vectors, the, um, the plane, the um, uh, missiles, intercontinental missiles. Uh, and on this, uh, on this point, Russia has the advantage because they have uh, worked on hypersonic for 20, for 20 years now, and uh, they know uh, and they have hypersonic um, um, uh, missiles who are able to, to go very, very fast on the other side. That's the second point. The third point is the space. If you are able to avoid a nuclear bomb to arrive on your country because you are able to neutralize the satellite environment, electromagnetic environment, if you are able to neutralize the weapons of, of the, not, not destroy, but neutralize the system of uh, guidance systems of these missiles. These missiles will start from the good point, but will never arrive to reach their, tar their targets. They will be lost between the two. And who has the advantage on this point? The control of space. <clears throat> who? Um, my opinion is Russia has the advantage now. On this, on this, uh, on this point, and the third point is uh, strategic depths of the territory. If Russia launch ten nuclear bombs on Europe, they will make more damage because in Europe, population is concentrated. Uh, industries are concentrated, infrastructure is concentrated. In Russia, they have a large, uh, very deep uh, strategic uh, depth. So uh, 10, 10 uh, European bombs or US bombs on Russia will make less damage than 10 uh, Russian bombs on our soil. Of course, all of these things are known by uh, by the staff. Military staff knows that. And if we are not today in a nuclear war, I don't think that will ever happen because uh, the West and the East also knows perfectly that there will be no winner, but the greatest loser will be the West. So that's that's uh, an evidence. It's, it's the reason why the West didn't start a real war and doesn't want to be uh, to be and to start in war with Russia. Uh, NATO has made, has made clear that they, they will not intervene. The US said the same. European Union says the same. And if you consider also the armed forces of the different sides, you, re you realize that uh, Europe is not ready for war. And the US neither. Neither the US. <clears throat> in Europe, manpower is insufficient. We have, we have been uh, uh, cutting the budget for 30 years. So we have not the weapons in good numbers. We have not uh, modern weapons in good numbers. We have just some, some uh, small quantity of, of modern weapons. We have a very uh, the number of uh, uh, manpower is insufficient to, to, to occupy the territory or to, to do whatever, 
to enter in war with uh, with um, Russia. So uh, if we have to to make a war with Russia, we will uh, we will lose. That's it. We have not not the means to win the war. We have not the means to win the war. And Russia till now has not used a, a lot of its power, just what is needed. And they don't want to to destroy Ukraine. They don't want to attack Europe. They just want to protect their sovereignty. And they want to change the world order. Instead of having a unipolar world, they, they want a multipolar world with uh, each part of this multipolar world respecting the state, the other state, that, that's all. So I don't want we can discuss with the, to come back to, to the beginning of the question. I, I don't think we can really discuss with uh, the small cabal who is leading the world in, in the US. It's not the US population. Population, the US population and the European population is not involved in, the, in this story. It's a small amount of people who lead the world. They have the medias, they have the uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, and, uh, and so on. They have uh, the finance, they control the finance, they control the politics because they help with their money, they buy the elections. And uh, if one, uh, one candidate is not on their line, they destroy it with their money. They put General, some, General some Delaware, money. General Delaware, yeah. excuse me for interrupting your very important yeah. and uh, profound Hold comments. On. However, I've received notice that some people have to leave shortly. So I want to make sure that they can get on and we will return to what you had to say. Okay. Bueno, muy bien. Entonces, vamos a proseguir ahora. Bueno, vamos a proseguir ahora eh, pidiendo disculpas eh, al general de la UAR porque hay varias personas que se tienen que retirar. Tenemos además una carta muy importante que nos ha llegado desde Bogotá, Colombia, que en particular me interesaría que respondan el diputado Robles y la diputada Huerta. Pero antes. We have received a letter from Bogotá, Colombia. We would like to ask a congressman. Uh, Robles and Huerta to answer, but we must first ad address a uh, question to uh, candidate Sarah. It's a, uh, we've, we've had this uh, question. She has to leave for a uh, campaign event. And it is a question to Mr. Ku, the following. Do you feel that the result of elections in the United States might mod modify the uh, course of the war, towards war? Diane, go ahead. Great, thank you very much. I do think that's a real possibility. Uh, it is very likely that if there is a Republican majority in either house or both, that the funding to Ukraine may be somewhat curtailed and certainly scrutinized. Uh, so that's possible, but I don't think it will rise to the level of what actually urgently needs to be done which is uh, to get the United States to go back to its founding intentions as a bulwark against British imperial policy. Uh, and since I do have to leave, I just wanted to say one thing uh, really along these lines, which I think that uh, mankind has to set its sights higher. Uh, I, I on this question of conscience, the idea that any child on the planet today is hungry is a crime against humanity. We don't know which child is the next Beethoven or Einstein. We seem to prepare to allow that poverty has to exist. And I don't think that's true. I also think if we want to be really broad minded, we should consider the fact that in four or five billion years or so, the sun is going to expand, contract, and our little planet will not exist. So 
we should stop wasting so much time squabbling because I don't know how long it's going to take us to figure out how to do something to make sure that the human species is immortal and we don't lose the works of these geniuses uh, by getting incinerated as our galaxy transforms. So I think the fact that we had the, the breakthroughs from the Webb telescope are very important. And I think uh, mankind has to consider its identity as an immortal species. And I want to thank everybody here. And I'm so sorry that I, I have to go. It's just uh, very pressing on my schedule these days. Good luck. Good luck to you. No, gracias. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I am sure you will be even busier uh, when you have to deal with your uh, responsibilities in Senate. We do have a letter that came in from Colombia, and it uh, alludes uh, directly to the statement by uh, Congressman Robles, as well as uh, Congresswoman Huerta's uh, comments. And I would like to read this because it is uh, directly relevant to everything we're talking. This comes from Jennifer Pedraza Sandoval. She's an economist from the uh, National University of Colombia, and she is also a uh, representative for the Dignity Party in the uh, Colombian Congress. This is the same party as uh, Congressman Rolero, the, the letter uh, says as far. I um, salute the initiative by legislators and former legislators for peace and uh, place my uh, seat in the Colombian Congress at the disposal of this initiative. As Congresswoman Huerta has stated, I feel that it is very important that a statement uh, that we carry to the various uh, legislatures and uh, organizations of many countries to obtain their support and signatures. Over the next few days, I will be intervening in the Colombian uh, House of Representatives to um, announce this initiative and invite my colleagues to join it. I will uh, make this address uh, recorded on video so that it remains uh, archived and available to legislators and citizens of the world. I would also uh, appreciate uh, if you would uh, forward to me the statement by the French mayors uh, that was uh, read today. Unfortunately, uh, uh, work responsibilities uh, draw me away from uh, the, this conference, but I want to uh, continue following up. Jennifer uh, Pedraza, uh, Dignity Party representative to the uh, Colombian Congress. I think that several of our Latin American representatives have uh, mentioned this, but most particularly uh, Congressman Robles and uh, Congresswoman uh, Huerta have made that point. And now, we are uh, running out of actual time. So these would be your final comments, please. Uh, uh, oh, would you please use your headset? Thank you. Well, um, comrades, uh, I would um, like to congratulate again the Schiller Institute, Helga, and all of you for uh, the uh, initiatives that have begin to appear today. First, a global alliance of organizations for world peace, which needs to be interwoven by each region into their local uh, uh, environment uh, to build a commitment from organizations which are already working for peace will join up with this uh, institute of the Schiller Institute that is being defined here. And then a global network of parliamentaries for peace, I think, that we should distinguish, as our uh, fellow uh, congresswoman in Colombia has uh, explained, is of the utmost importance, because it is very important to distinguish between the kind of mobilizations that are already occurring in the world, like the German and French cases that we've seen in video and have heard 
uh, letters, and I understand is also happening in Great Britain and other uh, countries around the world. This would be the mobilization of citizens' organizations and who would also, as citizens, have the right to participate individually as uh, citizens active in networks that wish to uh, collaborate in this network, as well as uh, uh, leaders of many different organizations. And in terms of the global network, it would I feel that it is uh, very important that uh, Congressman uh, Lopez and others of us involved in this effort begin uh, are already beginning to put together the list of uh, parliamentaries, parliamentarians and legislators who can uh, join into a, a, a produce a, a manifesto of world legislators specifically hmm, demanding of uh, international authorities whether it be the un or whatever with a in in the name of this global parliamentarism or parliamentary movement are demanding that these uh, authorities take concrete steps towards peace. I would say that in furtherance of this organization, all of you perhaps have more global experience, but we would need to go country by country, region by region to uh, make an inventory and identify the links and connections that each of us has in each country to uh, assemble this uh, roster uh, in the same way that it uh, can be done uh, by, or, for instance, in the uh, German case, I think the leaders and organizations have already been identified. They are also linking up with the French. We know them too. So now we would move to meetings. I'm not sure what uh, how Helga feels about this, but there could be organizational meetings uh, preparatory to our next seminar. It seems to me that the next seminar cannot be uh, merely uh, analytical, uh, an analysis of uh, what is to happen, but that the seminar needs to be built around a world mobilization already underway and a parliamentary, uh, a parliamentary movement also uh, already active to stop the war and uh, move this initiative forward in terms of the new financial order and so forth. It is not a question of leaving these initiatives, uh, setting them aside, but to continue building on that uh, to the extent that more and more organizations and legislators um, uh, join our ranks. Thank you very much for your attention and Helga, thank you. Well, thank you indeed for your uh, ideas and contributions, and especially your suggestions. I would like to ask uh, Senator uh, Robledo if you have any final words uh, before you uh, leave the session. Oh, could you repeat, please? Well, I, I read the letter that came from uh, the your uh, the, uh, Jennifer Pedraza Sandoval from your uh, party, Dignity Party, and she offered to uh, present this proposal to the um, Colombian Congress, House of Representatives. So it's not quite a question, but uh, you know, asking for your view on this initiative that uh, she has made on behalf of your party and, uh, and uh, her colleagues in the Colombian Congress. So uh, in uh, light of this, I was wondering if you would like to uh, make any additional uh, comments to the group. Well, first of all, Dennis, I want to um, welcome that uh, letter from Jennifer Pedraza. I've had many, many uh, communication issues, but I am so glad that we've been together. And in the case of Dignity, party in Colombia, we will be what well, we will stay on top of this and we will remain in touch with you uh, to further this democratic struggle that uh, is so required by the world, Latin American 
and uh, all of my uh, comrades in uh, my uh, associates in the Dignity Party, and we will uh, contribute in every way possible. Well, thank you very much for contributions that you have made so far, and you will surely continue uh, to contribute. I saw Mr. Ku, George Ku, had raised his hand, but I don't see him in the uh, on the screen right now. I, I wanted to address that question on U.S. elections, uh, but I don't see him, so we are on the final stretch, and I would like to uh, request of uh, Donald Ramotar if uh, you have any uh, uh, answers to any of this question. And then if uh, Congressman uh, Robles is able uh, to join us again in spite of his connection issues. And finally, a uh, parting words by Mrs. Lurge. Uh, Mr. Ramotar, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, just um, uh, I, I, I didn't answer the one part of the question that was asked to me just now about the G20 meeting in Indonesia. I would say, um, despite the fact that it, it might not have a high possibility of bringing in uh, great positive results, I believe any meeting now would be a step forward. And if, um, if uh, President Putin and President Biden can meet, I think that would be a, a great, a big step forward. And hopefully we can build on it. I don't think we should uh, not necessarily rule it out, but I would be happy to see if they can meet and hopefully that they can come to. And I believe probably we should, um, we should whatever, there's just a short time left, but whatever influence we have to try to encourage that and to um, push for it, I think it, it, it is necessary for us to do so. Um, I just want to say, I think our, our discussions were uh, very fruitful. I want to uh, thank everyone for their participation and, and for the contributions that they have made. I think the cross fertilization of ideas are very important for us at this point in time and to, for us to have this international cooperation because we only, have, we only know about one world that is habitable right now. We, talk, we know about the possibility, probability of others, but we're only sure about this one and it is our duty to save it. Thank you and all the best to everyone. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, if uh, let us uh, find out if uh, Congressman Robles can join us. He seems to be in a uh, in a call. But he obviously clearly has a responsibilities at this time. They are in session in Congress. So to uh, finalize our discussion, I will then uh, yield the floor uh, for some final words from uh, Schiller Institute founder Helga Zeplerusch. Yes. Um, well, I think that uh, we are on a on a good way. Um, I think that the one aspect I would like to bring a little bit more into focus, and that is the fact that the reason for the war danger is not just, you know, in the military strategies and military capacities, and uh, can can. You know, can a war be won? And I'm I'm saying that in response to General de la Vard. But the war danger, um, in my view, comes from the fact that the one system is collapsing and the other system is rising. And unfortunately, judging on the, you know, on the character and performance of some of these uh, leaders, you know, it, on, on the higher level, I do not put it behind them that they, rather than allowing that China and the other countries are rising, that you know they they will go in the way of provocations. And if you look at the prehistory of World War One uh, and also World War Two, the problem is wars are not a rational decision. So I think we should not be complacent and say you know the war cannot happen because it cannot be won. I think we have the real danger that it will, uh, it could happen. And the reason is that the Western financial system is blowing out. And we will experience extremely stormy weeks ahead. I, I put my reputation on the line that this will happen. Germany, for example, will crush against the wall with the present government 
uh, you know, the Greens in the government will make sure that we will have an explosion of, of energy crisis. And you heard the two people speaking from Germany from these demonstrations. There are thousands of more and they are fighting for their existence. And that is a very new phenomena. This is Germany, which used to be the fourth largest economy of the world. And people are really getting completely desperate. So therefore, I think the collapsing of the financial system is something we have to absolutely take into account and also address in the kinds of proposals we will put forward. So I would suggest that given the fact that the G20 meeting will take place on the 15th and the 16th of November, and you know, I think meeting is a very important step, but the G20 is the body which represents the large, you know, the largest part of the world population. And if they are not addressing this question of the war danger and the fact that the financial system is collapsing, then that puts us in a different geometry. I do not exclude that, for example, between you know Modi and Xi Jinping and Putin and uh, you know others representing the new system that they may come up with some major initiative at that G20 meeting. And I think we should demand that. But if they are not, you know, then that makes our job all the more greater. And therefore, I would suggest that we have the next meeting uh, on the 22nd of November. That's before Thanksgiving in the United States. And it's before, it's you know, it's, it's basically three and a half weeks. So that's given the dangers, a, a, a good time span uh, for us to organize. And uh, maybe between um, Congresswoman Huerta and Dennis, myself, and other volunteers, that we should organize an interim a task force so that we can actually professionalize that outreach, what we have been discussing now. Because you know, I think we need to you know, really explore uh, this network building in a in a very quick and professional way. So I would invite everybody who wants to volunteer in that, you know, that you should contact us and that we, you know, if you all agree that we really convene the next meeting on the 22nd and make that a real, a real, you know, major step ahead in our efforts. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Helga, y bueno, gracias a todos. Thank you, Helga, so much. Thank, uh, thank you, everyone. Indeed, the issues of security and development are interconnected in the same way that security is uh, unavoidably indivisible uh, in this world on the verge of thermonuclear crisis. So there can be no security for one unless there is a security for the rest. So whether you like it or not, we are citizens of the world. Likewise with development, there can be, there cannot be development for one or two without development for all. I would like to reiterate what uh, uh, Benito Juarez said, and my uh, uh, corollary to that, that uh, among individuals as among nations, the respect for the rights of others to develop is peace. And uh, we will uh, uh, leave now uh, to join on the 22nd of November at a uh, new uh, seminar, which will necessarily be a two-part seminar uh, due to the uh, extension of uh, the items we need to cover. And I would not like to finish here without first thanking Congresswoman Maria de los Angeles Huerta Montoya and the um, Mexican House of Representatives who have given us the uh, support and assistance uh, for this second seminar, which is the uh, uh, the uh, introduction to the third. Uh, very uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, the best to everyone. Goodbye.